want to do a sound check from my end. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you, Brian. Thank you. I'm working off of my iPad today. I have a little uh -huh. bit of connectivity issues here at yeah. home. Okay. If you're here for thesis reviews, let's get organized. Brian. Okay. Brian's on the screen. All right. So if you're a juror, you can sit in the front. <laughs> All right, join us. Stefano, you're in the front, you're a juror. <laughs> okay, welcome to the third and final day of thesis presentations for the Master of Architecture. Um, we'll begin by having our jurors introduce themselves. Um, we'll have four presentations this morning, be alternating between these two panels. We'll do two presentations, we'll have a five minute break, We'll rotate the boards um, so the presentations on the back are at the front now um, and we'll go from there so i think i'll start at this end just a brief introduction hi i'm ralph cunningham from cunningham quill architects here in washington thank you hi corey sharpless shop architects in new york i'm nandor mitrasak i'm a project um architect and urban designer with ralph at cunningham quill architects i'm stefano passeri faculty here and run my own digital design practice Hi, I'm Kelly Seltzer. I'm with HRNA Advisors. I'm a planner. I'm Christina Crenshaw, Maryland alum. I am on the faculty at Howard, and then I have a small interiors focused design studio. Hi, I'm Alec Deary. I'm also an alum, and I uh, have a practice in Annapolis called Grid Architects. Thanks. So we'll pull up the presentation for Miguel, and whenever you're ready. Okay. Let's do it. The slides are over there. So maybe I can turn around. Thank you, man. This, this one right here. Okay. Hi. Uh, oh, sorry. Hi. Good morning. Uh, my name is Miguel Mora, and this is my thesis presentation for Boulder's Missing Community. Now, before I want to begin, uh, because it is a little early in the morning, I wanted to ask, has anybody here been to Boulder, Colorado? Great. Does anybody want to share any thoughts, experiences on the city itself? Cool. Oh, mountains are beautiful. Yeah, so beautiful. Um, yeah, and it's it's a beautiful, vibrant city, a uh, vibrant city that I fell in love with uh, early on. And this is how uh, I want to make a change into Boulder. So Valmont Park District, the housing crisis that plagues the United States is something that has remained unaddressed with no signs of improvement anytime soon. The housing crisis not only creates disparities among populations, but also promotes an unsustainable model of living that affects the lives of many. This thesis is a proposal that addresses this issue in Boulder, Colorado, a city that has been suffering from rising costs of housing for decades. In order to address the issue, this thesis introduces an urban development named the Valmont Park District that will bring people to the city between the mountains and reality. So before I get into the thesis, I want to share some information about Boulder uh, for those who have not been there, um, and just so we have a general idea about it. Uh, so I'm going to go into uh, Boulder's history, uh, the crisis that grips it today, uh, and then the city's remedies. Uh, once we have a basic understanding of that, that's when I will dive into the thesis itself. So Boulder, uh, it was a city founded in 1857 uh, when um, 
when a lot of miners uh, came from the east and settled into uh, what is Denver today. Um, Boulder itself started to grow uh, because it was such a close town to the mountains, uh, specifically the flat irons, which you guys can see right here. Um, and in that area, they found a lot of gold um, and it just helped uh, the city prosper. And today Boulder is a very vibrant city. Um, it, as you guys can see, the flat irons just adorn uh, the city itself. It creates a backdrop uh, everywhere you go, you can see it. Um, and it's, like I said, it's a vibrant uh, community with a college, a very large college, the uh, University of uh, Colorado Boulder. Um, and yeah, it just brings a lot of people in every year. The city itself, the people there, um, they also have a very sustainable way of life. Um, it's very uh, heavily, it's heavily uh, geared around sustainable living, like bicycling everywhere you go, um, walking, and just a lot of uh, nice practices that we should start to consider doing ourselves. And like I said, it's very vibrant. Lots of people always interacting with each other. This is uh, from Pearl Street Mall in downtown Boulder. Um, this area is packed all the time. And so the housing crisis that is in Boulder today. Sorry, I'm just going through here. So even though the city is beautiful and vibrant, its residents face the grim reality of rising housing prices without any sight of slowing down. Um, so here are some statistics about the housing crisis itself. So the median home value is 729,000 with a median, uh, with a national uh, home value at 480. So that's a pretty huge difference. And then it gets even crazier when you get to the median household income. So with median home values at 729,000, uh, the household income coming in at 76,000 is much, much uh, lower and it's harder to attain uh, the housing there. Uh, the median age is also pretty uh, relatively low because of the university, um, but the, also uh, the poverty percentage is at 20%, uh, further showing the need for affordable housing. And here are some examples of some houses uh, for sale. So these, you can see that the prices per square foot are really high. Um, I think <clears throat> average, we're looking at $500 per square foot uh, in Boulder. And so why is this a problem? Uh, this is a problem because it shifts the population towards an older population. Uh, this can become an issue because the, the vibrancy of Boulder could get lost. Um, along with that, the, the high prices uh, <clears throat> result in people having to leave the city and find housing elsewhere, uh, creating increases in traffic and pollution. And then lastly, uh, there's the issue of the brain drain. Uh, with the university being the biggest uh, in the state, um, Boulder, uh, Boulder attracts a lot of people, but once they graduate, they cannot sustain the pay that like necessary to live there. And so Boulder, this is not an issue that has not gone unnoticed for the city. Um, I've actually sat in several of their uh, board meetings and all that. And um, yeah, it's something that they're always trying to work towards. Um, so a few of the remedies that they have are per permanently affordable housing program, um, the homeowner, home to owner down payment assistance program, and some other uh, pilot programs that are constantly being introduced uh, with every board meeting that I've seen so far. Um, and then lastly, the opportunity zone. This one is one that incentivizes developers to build in a certain area um, in order to uh, incentivize or in order to help the city grow. And so the site. So the site actually sits in the opportunity zone. Um, and right now, here it is. Um, it is a light industrial zone. Uh, or, so I'm sorry, the, this site takes into consideration uh, the light industrial zone and complexes that are around the opportunity site. Um, and Specifically, we're looking at Valmont Park. Uh, Valmont Park is a park that sits about 2.5 miles away uh, from the downtown area. Um, and it has uh, industrial complexes that flank uh, the park on each side um, and on the south and to the northeast. 
Um, the total area of the park is roughly 270 acres uh, with the regional park itself accounting for 82 acres of them. Here are some images of the uh, area. As you can see, it's very misused uh, land. It's a lot of storage facilities, a lot of parking and several dealerships. And as we know, dealerships like to use parking lots. So there we go. And so now we're starting to look a little bit deeper into the fabric that is Valmont Regional Park. So here's a figure ground uh, overlaid on top of the uh, site plan. And uh, you can see that there is no sense of scale. There's no relation between uh, what's on the site and what is surrounding it. Here's another figure ground, and this one's a little bit simplified, but it shows what the area of the park is uh, and which ones and which buildings uh, remain on the site. So first, in order to tackle this problem, <clears throat> I wanted to start setting up, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, I wanted to start setting up uh, boundaries for the site. So to the north of the site, we have Valmont Road that drives or that goes all the way into downtown Boulder. And then to the south, we have Pearl Parkway as well. Uh, Pearl Parkway actually um, converts into Pearl Street, which is the main road. It's the main street of Boulder. And then we have also Goose Creek, uh, which runs in between um, two of the industrial complexes. Uh, and this is something that we take into advantage of a little bit later on. So once we identified the site boundaries, uh, we wanted, I wanted to look into uh, implementing a grid. So the grid that I implemented on the site actually comes from uh, two different cities. Uh, one from Boulder, uh, they have a grid or they have a block size that is 300 by 300. Um, and then Denver, it has a, um, a block size that is 400 by 200. And you're gonna see it implemented here. So as you can see in the, on the Western side, that 300 by 300 block is very much uh, noticeable as a lot of the blocks there um, try to reach those dimensions. Um, along with that, this also, uh, in highlighting the blocks, it also highlights the uh, primary paths uh, that I wanted to construct throughout the site in order to create an interconnected uh, site. And once, that has been, uh, once that path has been identified, I introduce nodes into uh, the different uh, neighborhoods. And what this does um, is it creates a sense of place for each neighborhood. And then this is the proposed figure ground for the Valmont Park District. And then this is the site plan for it. So as you can see, you can definitely see the nodes in there, the uh, urban parks um, all around uh, that, each, um, that each neighborhood has, uh, but also you can start to see the types of building blocks that are going into it. Um, yeah. And then this is the places diagram. And what this does is it shows the highlighted primary paths, but also relating to the nodes that each neighborhood has. Um, each park, or each node uh, is a park for the neighborhoods. And that way it creates a sense of place, a sense of belonging for each individual neighborhood. And this is an aerial of the site. Um, as you can see, this, the, this project not only redesigns uh, the, what was the built environment in the area, but also proposes a new design for the park. And the park is something that you know, I it definitely needed to be addressed as it was something that was unused. It was left uh, in decay. And uh, actually when uh, I went to visit the site, um, it was nothing but prairie dogs and dirt. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a nice walk though, the, the flat irons helped. And so now we're gonna start getting a little bit deeper into the neighborhoods. So there are four neighborhoods uh, to this thesis. There's Valmont Terrace, Valmont Pearl, Industry Park and Maker's Yard. Each one has an individual character uh, to it. And um, yeah, let me take you through it. So the first one is Valmont Terrace. So Valmont Terrace is the residential neighborhood of uh, the site. Um, it's, very, it's very similar to that of uh, Boulder uh, in terms of 
it's a very walkable community. Um, but there's a sense of, or there's an emphasis on smaller architecture uh, because of the response to the neighborhood to the north. Here's an architectural um, expression of Valmont Terrace. Uh, the architecture that is in the site is a little bit reminiscent of a Renaissance type of architecture, but also a little bit Southwest. Um, and at the bottom here, this transect section, uh, you can see a little bit better on the boards, um, but what it does is it shows the characteristics as you progress through Valmont Terrace. Valmont Pearl is a little bit of the modern uh, neighborhood of um, the Valmont Park District. Uh, this one takes into account the architecture that takes place in Boulder, the new, the chic, I, I guess you want to call it. Um, but that way it doesn't seem so out of place from Boulder. And especially because of that connection with uh, Pearl Parkway, it creates a nice, easy transition between the two. Like I said, the architecture here is a little bit more minimalist, a little bit more modern. Um, and if you really look close on the uh, on the transect, you can see that it's a huge variety of different buildings. Um, and that's just because of the large size that Valmont Pearl is, uh, and the fact that it has to mediate between Valmont Terrace and the next neighborhood, which is uh, Industry Park. And then Industry Park. So this neighborhood is the entertainment center for of uh, Valmont uh, Park District. Um, it's the most commercially driven neighborhood of the site and it has an emphasis on larger floor plate, um, sorry, uh, larger large scale industrial architecture that pays homage to the site's previous use and Boulder's industrial history. Um, so one of the interesting things is this park here uh, terminates uh, Pearl Street, um, if, you're, if we're looking at it from a satellite image. Um, and that actually was determined by a train line that was uh, that ran across Colorado uh, until the 1920s, if I'm not mistaken. And like I said, the architecture here is very much industrial uh, inspired. Um, and the large uh, floor plates are to create this nice, um, like this nice uh, wall, this nice, uh, I'm sorry, that's nice backdrop for the park itself. And then Maker's Yard, uh, this one is actually the only, the only purely residential neighborhood in the site. Uh, this one features a community garden uh, that can be accessed to all. And um, it has the typology or the architecture in the site uh, is very much inspired by the prairie style that uh, dominates in Colorado. Um, and for this, the townhomes in there, uh, there's a variety of different style or different uh, units, I should say, or models. And by placing them in different areas and just changing the variety a little bit, it creates this neighborhood that doesn't necessarily just all look the same. And so the impact that Valmont Park District has on Boulder. I'm sorry. Uh, aside from the life that the Valmont Park District brings into East Boulder's fabric, it also introduces improvements to Boulder's existing urban fabric. That is a mosaic of Boulder's communities. Uh, the improvements on the urban fabric um, address the lack of connectivity between the various communities, sorry, um, and the architectural expression of the city. These improvements on the fabric would provide a pleasurable pedestrian experience for the residents of Boulder and promote the vibrant lifestyles and characteristics. So looking at the connectivity, uh, the first thing I started to look at are the street sections. Um, the street sections in Boulder, uh, typically on the main streets, they are 80 foot uh, uh, sections and they do not provide too much um, too much like street trees, too much protection from um, any moving vehicles. And so that's what I wanted to do for both the 60 foot section and the 80 foot. Um, the 60 is the one that is a street section that uh, is used for any minor streets, any secondary streets. And the 80 foot is the main uh, street that guides you from development or from neighborhood to neighborhood. 
Goose Creek section, this is uh, the thing I was talking about earlier that we would get to, um, but this creek is one <clears throat> that was designed to help mitigate flood, flood waters. Uh, so back in 2013, there was actually a really big flood in Boulder uh, that actually devastated the community, but Goose Creek performed way better than Boulder Creek, which is a natural uh, occurring uh, flood prevention system. And so with that, I wanted to highlight it um, and make it into a another node, a, a place that you enjoy rather than just see and not, not interact with. And Valmont Road, uh, Valmont Road itself has no sidewalks um, and no, nothing to slow vehicles down. It's just straight road. And if you love speeding, you're gonna have fun over there. But because uh, this urban development is one that promotes walkability and um, interconnectedness, that, that had to change. Another part of the connectivity is the mixing of uses and income. Um, even though this is not necessarily a way like a physical connection, it's a way to connect the people of Boulder. Um, rather than uh, rather than subscribing to the thought or the the design of Euclidean zoning, single use zoning, um, the mixing of uses and incomes uh, helps integrate the community altogether. Another part of the connectivity uh, that this site or this thesis uh, introduces is urban parks. Like I said earlier, urban parks not only give uh, a characteristic or a sense of place for each neighborhood, but it also creates a way, a, a wayfinding element uh, for those visiting the site. Um, and I'm gonna go through them real quick. So this right here, this is Valmont Commons. Uh, this is the urban park that is in uh, Valmont Terrace. And then this is Flatiron Square. Uh, so the name actually comes from uh, the fact that the Flatirons, <clears throat> um, if you were to look over to them, you have a great site, uh, great view from them. And then this is the Maker's Yard. And like I said, it has a terraced uh, community garden uh, that anybody can uh, take full advantage of. This um, this urban park is Valmont Quad. So the reason why it's called Valmont Quad is because uh, right near it is a library and an elementary school um, that can take full use of the park, um, not only just for a nice day out, but also there are some uh, programmed reading nooks and just spaces so that it's it's a nice serene experience there. And then this is industry industry mall um, in in the Valmont Industry Park. And this one is, this urban park is surrounded by the large uh, floor plate buildings um, with the ar uh, industrial architecture that, um, that calls back to the history of Boulder. So the impact of Valmont Park District on the architecture. So the architecture expression within Boulder is one that is currently plagued with non-hierarchical, multi-dimensional, multi-material architecture of present day urban development. Each building demands attention to itself in an urban fabric that is about coexisting rather than competing. This, along with the strict Euclidean, Euclidean ordinances, creates an ill-defined transect of the city that hurts its pedestrian experience. And in response to this, the Valmont Park District proposes a mix of typologies and building forms, diverse yet continuous street walls uh, that that further um, expand the pedestrian experience uh, for those visiting. So first, looking at the new building forms that are proposed uh, to the site, these of course are not necessarily new to us, but it is new to Boulder. Uh, the first one is a carriage house on the left. Uh, the carriage house is not something that is used um, often over there. And what this, and by implementing it, it can allow for um, an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, this can help um, mitigate the disparities in income, um, but also creates intergenerational housing. Uh, the next uh, on the right is the way in which townhomes can be divided. Uh, it can either be a strict townhome, it can be a two over two, or it can have an English basement. Um, the two over two and the English basement, what these do is that they also create another uh, form of housing, uh, not just pure ownership, but also 
um, inter, uh, intergenerational as well. And then the last one is the wrap building, uh, they call it. I have been calling it the Texas Donut this whole time until I had to look it up. But uh, so the wrap building, what this does is on the first floor, it wraps uh, retail around a parking structure. And so what this does is it hides the parking uh, from the street wall, um, but it also promotes the, the retail um, all along it. And then above it, uh, you can have housing. And these houses can have uh, courtyards on top of the uh, parking garage that's in the middle. And the building expression. So I know that these are elevations that we've already seen, but this is just going back to that idea of uh, continuous street wall. Even though these facades are completely different in style, if we were to put them next to each other, you could see that they follow the same rhythm uh, and same uh, regulating lines. However, they are completely different. And this is one of the objectives of the thesis is creating variety with repetition. And here we go again with the uh, industrial facade and then those of the maker's yard. And so in the conclusion, uh, the, housing, the housing crisis is something that cannot be solved in a vacuum. It must be thought of as a part of a larger plan. It is related to patterns of development, density, modes of movement, and the integration of different uses. Essentially, continuing the way we are now, which is misusing land, will not solve the problem. It will only make it grow. Um, and the solution for this has to be integrative. It cannot be, uh, we cannot continue with this, the single use uh, zoning. And in short, the Valmont Park District is a proposal to Boulder's urban fabric that is meant to reverse the hold that single use Euclidean zoning has on Boulder. Rather than promote a high cost of living with an unattainable housing market, Boulder should revert to its initial roots as a city. Rather than oppose density and mixed or mixed use urbanism, it should be embraced as it will continue to bring life and diversity to the city between the mountains and reality. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Is north up in this? Yes, north is. Explain the neighborhood or whatever is happening. Could, could somebody get Ralph a microphone? Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if it's on already. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't want to hear it, Ralph. But yeah, let me. Neighbor, neighbor, I just want to hear you, Ralph. That's all. That was. <laughs> can you hear me now? All right, good. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, so is north up? Yes. The, okay. Yes. And the neighborhood to the north of the park, which has all the diagonals in it, what is that? The neighborhood to the north of the park. The yeah, up. I'm sorry. So hold on. Let me actually. Let me. Yeah, if you could pull, pull it up, up the... so we can all be on the same page. Kenny, did you? Thank you. Sorry to make you stand up. Thank you, Kenny. I can okay. Well, uh, yeah, back one. That. So, maybe I'll help you. So, what is this? Okay. So, thank you for uh, bringing that up. So, the surrounding context around uh, around the site um, it varies between industrial use, uh, which is to the south, and to the north. The site you're talking about is a trailer home. Trailer. That's what park. I thought it was. Okay. Yeah. Um, and there's actually two. Uh, mm -hmm. There's this one right here, and then this one over here. Okay. Um, and the park is, is is that an existing park? Yes. Um, so let me go back a few. And by a few, I mean a lot. No. Here we go. Ah, yeah. Wow. So park is a sort of a euphemism. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when I actually did the site visit out there, um, I actually stopped to talk to a few locals. Um, it was it was a really fun experience just because I don't know it's it's weird getting stopped by locals or by a random person but I digress um, the park all the the only thing that people use the park for is the frisbee golf course which is this mm -hmm. right here and the bike park which is right up here okay everything else like I said prairie dogs and dirt that's it so that 
piece to the north of the park, the, the thing that has the pond or the lake, that's part of the park. Yes, that is okay. part of the park. And um, so you're able to plan the park, I mean, in your proposal. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was my question. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Larger. Do you have a larger site plan that shows this site in relationship to actual downtown Boulder? Uh, you, said I, it was two, you said it was two and a half miles? Two and a half miles from the downtown. Um, okay. So it's so it's actually yes. walkable even if I don't know what the if you have to cross major highways to get there, but exactly. So okay. you do have to cross this highway here. This mm -hmm. is Foothills Parkway. Uh, this one actually connects Boulder to the surrounding cities, uh, Denver and Longmont. Um, but yeah, the great thing about the site, though, is that to get across the highway, you don't have to actually cross it. There's underpasses uh, with the paths uh, okay. for biking, just walking all out. OK. Uh, to the west, so to the left. Yes. Um, well, I, I mean, I have the microphone, so I guess I'll start. Unless we have other questions. First of all, I'm, I'm, I'm literally kind of blown away. Um, I want to commend you for such a thorough project and, and presentation. Um, Thank you. This is at a level that I've, lit I literally see like this would be a schematic design level by a professional planning Thank firm, you. and the fact that you as a student. Um, don't have, you know, you don't, you don't have access to like the full team, all the data, all the drivers. Um, you know, if, if we were doing a project like this, we'd be, you know, we'd be team with the developer and team with, you know, working with the city and team with a company like HRNA doing, you know, doing all the financial driver piece. Um, so you're, so in a way, like you're missing a lot of the data that would, would be needed to make this like a real like to have the real drivers of this plan, but you've anticipated kind of enough of it and the way that you've gone about it is is like just just so smart and thoughtful. Thank you. Um, I mean, I really feel like you could be hired by the city of Boulder, the oh. planning department and work with them to, you know, to develop this further in a way. And um, one, so one of the things that I am curious about in your, when you went and sat, you know, in the community board um, meetings and things, um, or the planning meetings, um, has there been discussion of actually, like, what would be needed to bring the jobs here? Because that's the other piece. It's not just the affordable housing, but when you talk, especially about the brain drain mm -hmm. of the of the young people leaving, it's because they don't have jobs, right? right? So, like, that would be the piece that I feel would be needed to make this work is like how are you you know how are you attracting or how is the how is the the city of boulder attracting um you know whether attracting companies um mm -hmm. industry to come here and build their headquarters or their plants or what have you um that will then kind of be the drivers we're actually working on a city plan um in florida that's doing exactly that right now. They're 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 um they're incentivizing chip manufacturers to come from Korea oh. um, to that, and that's going to be like the first kind of piece of it. And then, but there, it's also close to Disney and it's close to some other things. So, you know, that piece has to be in place. But that's obviously not like your issue right now. But but that would be that would that would kind of make this real. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing I just want to just want to like point out because if this were real, you know the and you were working with city planning, they would be putting out, you know, an RFP that might be like a private public, public private partnership. There'd be developers bidding on this. There might be de multiple developers. There would be multiple architects. So this wouldn't be like one, probably wouldn't be, it might be one developer, but it would definitely not be like one architect. This right. would be planned in phases. The developers would bring in teams. And so in a way, like your job wouldn't be to actually design what all the buildings look like, but to, you know, create the zoning and to create the design guidelines, which might be about the kind of, you know, breaking up the massing and the different kind of materials that you can use and, and all that thing, which would be like the next layer of this. Right. But this is very real. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. And just like the thoughtfulness of how you're thinking about connecting back to Boulder and everything. I just really, really, um, yeah, I'm really impressed with it. Thank you. Um, I do want to address uh, the thing you said about, you know, bringing uh, commerce over. Okay. Uh, I, so I actually met with the uh, city, the principal city planner uh, in Boulder. Um, she was nice enough to uh, talk to me about my project or my thesis and uh, help me out. And one of the things that she said uh, is that the retail spaces along the site. Um, well, let me say this first. It was actually one of my concerns. I thought it was too much retail for a site that might not be able to sustain it. Um, and one of the things that she suggest, suggested 
is that Boulder has a lot of individual uh, craftsmen, uh, just it, it has a lot of uh, startup companies. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the retail spaces, it's not just for, uh, you know, not big box stores, but like name brand stores, uh, it's maker spaces. Um, that way it attracts um, those up and coming um, business business people, entrepreneurs, there we go, <laughs> um, over to Valmont Park District. Yeah, that's that's a hard, I'm mean, just from experience, like that's a hard model to sell and we've tried to sell it a lot. Gotcha, <laughs> okay. It yeah. usually winds up falling through, unfortunately, um, because they're, you know, the, the financial model is that the, um, that the, the developers, the landlords are looking for long-term leases on Oh, like a, a credit tenant or anchor tenant. So there might be some small pieces of those maker, uh, you know, some of, some of the, well, I'm thinking of Industry City in, in, in Queens, mm -hmm. which has a lot of that maker space. Um, but, but it's, it's, but I think to, I think you need some, I think you need bigger, like foundational anchor okay. to, work to drive it. But I mean, that's like, yeah, if you can, if you can get that and attract people here and, you know, the city would have to look at what incentives they're going to give you know, right. to get like the Amazon or the whoever it is that they want to get here, the, um, and what kind, you know, what kind of what kind of industry they're going to attract? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be tech? Is it going to be something else? And then, and then, what are the financial incentives that they can do to get those people here? And then, then it, it's just it builds from there. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'll just echo some of those same um, topics. Uh, I think this is. A great project and it's such an important topic uh there's a mass migration going on in the united states right now where you know since the pandemic and even before then uh there's been a kind of an exodus from kind of northern colder cities and coastal cities to the mountain west mm -hmm. um and you'll see i mean there's population booms you know people are working from home so they can they're free to work anywhere in the united states they're choosing places like boulder colorado boise idaho bishop california salt lake city you know these these kind of mid-sized cities are in an acute housing crisis, which you you mentioned. And yeah, you could easily take this project and kind of replicate it across the Mountain West because there's such a great need right now in the United States. So right. uh, kudos to you. Thank you, you. You picked the perfect and very timely uh, topic and project, and I think it's uh, worth thinking even broadly. You know, just kind of there are many cities that need this type of intervention. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then this this uh, my second comment is kind of specific to denver colorado area in general but i think okay. it's it's broad to the united states as well uh, there was a kind of a interesting article a couple of years ago and i think it was the denver post and there were a lot that these reporters were just kind of walking around the city and they were like why are all these new buildings these new multifamily buildings why do they all look the same they're all five over one podium blocky flat kind of boring looking buildings why and then you go to every other city in the united states they're all the same Right. And there are a lot of good economic reasons why, and you know, any architect that is in the industry can tell you exactly why that it is the way it is. Uh, but I do think um, one way you can kind of combat that, specifically here, is kind of just think about the place. Mm -hmm. uh, Boulder is such a great city; it's so unique. It's you know, it prides itself on its outdoorsy community. It's one of the mountain bike and rock climbing capitals of the world. It, everyone has a pair of skis, and every time there's a powder day, they're driving into the mountains. Uh, you know, there's a cultural it's very culturally unique and interesting. So I think you could kind of build off of that and make the urban design and the architecture, you know, kind of reflect that culture. Mm -hmm. um, and also the landscape itself, it's a desert landscape. It really is dry. I mean, you have a lot of trees, but that's not yeah, going to happen yeah. in reality. There's no grass. It's like, you know, just these dry stream beds. It's like a desert. And then you have the backdrop of, of the mountain, the Rockies and mm -hmm. kind of the foothill of the Rockies and their snow cap and so stark and beautiful. It's almost like a hostile landscape. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, the urban design and architecture could also reflect that. Those, these are like some of the cues that you can enrich and kind okay. of make this development unique to Boulder. I think that would be the next step of layering the design. Okay. Yeah, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing better now that I'm done. <laughs> All right. So I have a question for you, and it really kind of links back to where you started your presentation mm -hmm. and that the kind of root cause of the problems that you're striving to fix mm -hmm. are the affordability issues of the mm -hmm. housing. And you started with that, 
you identify the effects of the cause. Mm -hmm. And then I listened to an excellent explanation of how you were solving the effects of the cause. Mm -hmm. And it was almost the end of your presentation before you got to how you were addressing the root cause mm -hmm. of all those problems. So my question to you is, how much thought did you give to your typologies of the buildings, which really are where your solution to the cause is, right? That's where you're starting to suggest new typologies that will bring in more affordable housing. Mm -hmm. But how much thought did you give to that? What's your makeup? How many of each unit type is in your development? Is that creating a high enough percentage of affordable opportunities to address some of the generational um, brain drain and things of that nature that are happening? Okay, well, thank you for the very loaded question. <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you asked um, because at first this thesis, it was an affordable housing uh, thesis. Um, and, you know, when I first started, I wasn't sure how to address it, but after sitting in those board meetings and meeting with the um, the principal planner of the city, um, I realized that the issue for affordable housing is coming from the lack of density. Um, the nimbyism, the not in my backyard culture in Boulder is very strong. Uh, so much so that it gets becomes really difficult to just do any developments. And so with the increase in density, uh, it increases um, like housing just itself. Um, and within that, it's a mix of uses. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure if I answered your question, um, but how far had, did I think into it? Um, I should have thought more into it. <laughs> so, so you did answer my question awesome. and, okay. and it kind of plays into the comment that was made earlier about you missing the financial information, mm -hmm. because I think that, um, in my mind, the thing that makes this the potential to be a strong, like really, really, it's already strong, but stronger thesis yes. is that it doesn't just look at the planning in order to address the density issues that contribute to affordable housing issues, but that it really dives into how many of those affordable typologies you're presenting and who would actually live in those typologies as a way to demonstrate how development can in fact help in a way that everybody wants with affordable housing without just creating another really expensive locale that these people still can't afford to mm -hmm. move into. And part of that has to be like a very conscious there needs to be this many of this type of unit, that many of that type of unit. These are the target populations. You know, this is the distribution so that people feel comfortable in order to really hammer at home. Um, but beyond that, that's kind of like my only sticking point with this. As a general concept, I, I really like what you've done. It looks like it's all very well thought out and ties into the, um, to the uh, local context and, and make sense. I just wanted to see you go more into like how you would actually address the affordable housing portion of it. Okay. Thank you. Mike. Thank you for the feedback. And yeah. I just wanted to chime in real quickly that, um, you know, that, that I think that's a very important comment and, and certainly uh, uh, Corey uh, uh, touched on that early on uh, from the very beginning over you know, almost a year ago when Miguel and I started working on this this project together, uh, where he started working on the project, I, I, I was the innocent bystander. Um, I, I kept thinking this would have been the ideal pairing of a, uh, a master of real estate development and uh, a master of architecture degree. Um, and if you had it to do over again, Miguel, um, I would have I would have tracked you back into that because this 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 kind of thesis would have been much stronger with the pro forma. I completely agree, and I spend my day job on housing finance, affordable housing finance. And um, I was pretty stunned that I think you nailed the typology um, that actually does make sense from a density and affordability standpoint, even though I think, you know, you're just one person, you didn't have a full team around you supporting, um, you know, to build a pro forma. But what I see in the two over two, and I would also love to know kind of the mix and how many of, how many of those units. But what I see in that is, um, you know, 
a, a site that would uh, typically in Boulder and historically have been developed with one house, and that house would be two, three, four million dollars today. Um, and a, I see an entry point for either home ownership or rent or rent to home ownership in the unit A and B, right? Because the residual land value there would be um, a foothold. You could be basically think about it as like an eight hundred thousand dollar house, which is still a very expensive house, mm -hmm. um, but it is also you know a portion of the people that have. Um, really no way of transitioning from rent to ownership if that's their kind of financial goal um, and or have been displaced. And I think the more you can pack in that density on this site um, and you know, your NIMBYs will think that it's pulling their values down. It actually isn't. Um, it just is densifying, um, you know, this site that I can imagine would also be very, um, very profitable to build as a master plan, you know, single family development. I really appreciate that you did the density thing here. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions, but if others want to touch on the housing part while we're on it. Okay. Um, so talk about the view shed you mentioned of the flat irons. Um, I lived in Colorado for a couple of years and people are and I work, I've worked in Boulder um, and people are obsessed with those flat irons and uh, want to just kind of understand how this site, even though it's distant, I think you, you've got some good opportunity there. Can you show us where we're? Yeah. So. Uh, exit. Sorry. Oh, no, she's. Oh, okay. out. Tell, tell us where, where the view shed is. And yeah. So I'm actually, I'm going to go back to a diagram. Uh, I'm going to pull it up on the screen, but I'm going to. Go over there in a second. I think it's this one here. And present, I think it's on the bottom here. No, that's not it. File, no, view, right? Mm -hmm. Man. Okay. Let me just go back to it real quick. I'm so sorry. I turned uh, 26 a few days ago and it's really hitting. Oh my goodness. Cool. Okay. <laughs> so um, the views. Uh, unfortunately, I did not render a perspective from uh, with the views of the flat irons, mm -hmm. but one of the things that I did with this. Uh, thesis is I continued that Pearl Street, uh, the Pearl Street, the historic uh, like train line that was introduced. And with that, it directly points to the Flatirons. Um, so if you're standing at the Industry Mall or you're looking up from Flatiron Square, um, the views are just straight on uh, towards the Flatiron. And also, I know that I haven't, I didn't talk too much about it, but um, the massing of it as well allows for those views okay. uh, yeah. just because well, one boulder has height ordinances uh, that are they're very strict about. Um, but also I wanted to continue that uh, because I think they're saying is if you see green, you'll think green. And so I wanted to keep that view of the flat irons, view of the trees, view of the mountains, uh, all throughout the site if possible. I will start with the context right yeah okay. could you repeat the question oh. <laughs> Sorry. thanks uh my my question was that what would help this presentation is to widen the lens out start with the state of colorado go to the city of boulder um, and then probably an intermediate step that would show uh, downtown Boulder, the Pearl District, and how it relates to this, because you're a little pushed in onto your own site, which is just natural that happened. But you, you got to put the context out. Yeah, I was I was going to say a very similar thing um, related to the context. I think first and foremost, totally agree about the thoroughness and the quality of the thinking agree that diving into the pro forma and the details of every piece of this would be super exciting to talk about. But I definitely think the the kind of general lack of context, and I think that 
it, it kind of runs throughout. I mean, I, I really would like to understand even just like how, how, how your project would kind of expand. And again, we're limited in time, but like you were asking about the motor, or the, you know, the mobile home area, like how does that get connected to this? How do you imagine that changing over time? Right. Um, and the things are, and the rest, the kind of feeling these streets and roads and the kind of development of this kind of pushing out. But I also, because it's also an architecture thesis, I would also say the same thing about the architecture. You know, I don't, I'm not sure it, I'm not sure that it feels like Boulder because I've never been and you didn't show me. I have no idea what the context of Boulder looks like. And it, it doesn't feel right to me. Right. So for instance, like that, I, when I first walked up and I looked at that image, I thought I, I thought I was in Baltimore thinking <laughs> that's like, that looks like Camden Yards to me. So I wasn't quite sure again, very thorough. Um, there's probably a lot there that I, that, that would resonate, but I, I, I need to, see, we need to see more in terms of the context of what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. And, uh, that was definitely an issue I had early on. I talked a little bit too much about Boulder early on in the semester because I love the city. Um, and so I definitely changed my scope for this. Uh, but I agree having context would be extremely helpful. And there's the other thing is like, there's so many, I don't, I don't have a lot of time left. There's so many little things that I would love to talk about with the plan specifically. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's, it's the, the framework, the basis for something like that starts a really great conversation. It's not like, it's not like, Oh, blow the whole plan up. It's like, you know, I'm not quite sure about why this, this edge gets eroded so much and why this thing, like it, mm -hmm. there's some things about it that bother me, mm -hmm. but generally I love the character, these little spaces and the, and how they all connect and how they relate to, relate to the park. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, you know, my questions are all leading and, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the edge of the park because that was sort of the first thing that I was looking at. And unfortunately for you, I spent this weekend in New York in Central Park. And um, of course, <laughs> you know, Central Park is a real estate development play yeah. more than, you know, that's why it exists. So what happens in Central Park, which I think could happen <laughs> here, and obviously the scale boulder is very different. I'm not trying to make this into New York City. But I think much taller buildings could line the park, mm -hmm. much taller, like like, you know, concrete frame, higher rise building. And I think that it would make the plan more interesting. Mm -hmm. I agree with the sort of jagged edge of the park face. I, I find very questionable um, given the skill of the rest of the plan. You know, I think the rest of the plan has a lot of skill, but I, I, I sort of feel like you might have looked at this a little backwards where you didn't start with the park. The park is sort of at the end of the, the story, not at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I would start planning with that asset and kind of move backwards from there. The other reason why I asked you about the park is, again, sorry, I went to Central Park, but <laughs> Central Park is full of all of these things, right? The, you know, you have a pool, you have other recreational facilities. I kind of wonder why they aren't all in the park. Right. Um, I totally agree with the nodal parks, the, the smaller parks that sort of come out of that. The other thing I'd really like to see you do, which you, you talked about, and, and I think it's kind of there, but this Goose Creek, um, you know, that as a kind of linear park that starts and ends the project and, and forms one of the edges of the park, I think is actually really interesting. Um, and then lastly, and we've, we've all kind of talked about the, you know, how realistic this all is. And I, I don't think that matter so much. Um, but one thing I do kind of wonder about is uh, cars and parking, mm -hmm. um, because you're going to have a lot of cars here. And is there any transit connection to Boulder from here to yes. downtown? Uh, so a lot of the existing uh, bus stops are still existing. Um, I preserved most of the uh, connections um, with the existing streets and all that just to preserve those uh, bus stops and just transit. So I would show that in a drawing. Okay. How that, that's really when we talk about, you know, showing the context, that's one of the contextual things is how do you get to, to downtown Boulder from this site? Right. And then lastly, I'll just say about the architecture. I, I'm curious, you know, the perspectives I think are very compelling. And I think the, the front, ele the elevations are really not. 
Um, and I kind of, it, it's almost like it was designed by two people. Um, so I would work on those elevations. I think they look um, a little generic, a little poorly proportioned. Okay. Um, I realized that you, it totally makes sense in this project. It's so big to start with urban design and work out. Um, and you, I'm probably you're required to show the elevations, were you? No. Okay. Uh, that was a choice. So I wouldn't. Oh. <laughs> if I were okay. you. I mean, well. if you don't have time, enough time to develop it, I just wouldn't show it. So, Fair enough. But because I think the perspectives show it in a much stronger light. Yeah. And really, the buildings are quite different in the perspectives than in the flat elevations, which I kind of wonder about. So, anyway, a great project. And, and you know, you took on a lot. So, you know, what we can do is talk around the edges, but but really great job. Thank you so much. Okay, let's um, pass it to Brian, who is standing by oh. for a final word. Oh, okay. I, I couldn't hear. I guess that's my cue, isn't it? Um, yeah. So, um, uh, Ralph, um, I agree with you. I think that the... Um, the vertical surfaces of these buildings are undercooked. Um, they, uh, I think uh, Miguel's biggest interest was to try to uh, step away from what uh, might be thought of as Rocky Mountain SketchUp as the solution to just about everything that you see in this area. Um, there's a kind of homogeny to the type of response to the architecture. And I think uh, Miguel was looking for variety, and, and in fact, the discussion about the vertical surfaces came late. Hey, look, um, I want to thank the reviewers for some great comments here. I want to thank Miguel for a great ride over the course of uh, the last um, almost year or so. Um, I always get worried when a student comes to me with a thesis that's focused on a distant place that he or he may have never been to before. And while Miguel had been to Boulder, um, I was concerned that it might be difficult for Miguel to really connect in a way that was necessary to make this thesis a reality. And given that Miguel is not shy, uh, he was really quick to reach out to uh, the various um, uh, offices in uh, planning in, uh, uh, in Boulder to meet with officials. He met with architects, including emeritus faculty from the University of Maryland even met with citizens on the street to talk about the project. And I, I think this was really a testament to, you know, the fact that architecture is, is really a social, um, a social medium and that Miguel is, is prepared for that. Um, early on, Miguel uh, was focused almost exclusively on the housing crisis and making affordable housing. That's, as I said before, that's when I, I kept saying, why isn't this guy doing a dual degree in real estate development as well? But what really became apparent as you look around the edges of the site is that everybody, all the patterns of development are, you know, are, are classic suburban sprawl patterns of development. Everything is planned as a little pod. Everything connects an arterial street. Everything is essentially a cul-de-sac. And early on, we, we started to channel the idea of pretend it's a city um, and that the solutions to this problem, uh, the housing problem, really are better understood if you expand the problem and try to look at uh, you know, the, uh, the synergies between various other problems that exist. And I think Miguel hit upon something. He, he mischaracterized it up front. And I, and I think Nandor picked up on it a little bit. He talked about the, um, the, 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 the active lifestyle that exists in, um, in Boulder. Uh, he described it as sustainable, the sustainable pattern of the citizens. I don't think the, the, the citizens there live a, a sustainable pattern, but they have an aspect, this, this uh, active lifestyle uh, that could be easily integrated uh, into, uh, into the city. And I think this has been one of the things that as this project has developed, uh, that the, 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 the relationship between the park, between streets that you can ride a bicycle on, that you can walk on, uh, that have integrated uh, functions and so forth are, are really kind of key to the, the whole thing. I think this idea of adopting the city um, is so important as the model to, to growth. Um, my colleague, Matt Bell, who may be in the room there, may not be, often reminds us that uh, the most important aspect of sustainability is patterns of development. If you blow the patterns of development, as we have done for um, since post-World War, War II, uh, then we're not going to be able to uh, 
to attain a sustainable world and, uh, and, and no number of gizmos is gonna get us there. So I wanna, Miguel, I wanna thank you for a great ride. Uh, I also wanna say that, um, um, you know, you've proven that uh, the, the old adage that uh, University of Maryland students are, are great shredders. Um, this project was in, in pieces about a week and a half ago. And it kind of came together in a quite a, a wonderful, comprehensive way. Congratulations. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. I just said it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Congratulations. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we'll rotate to this side of the room for the next presentation. I saw that too. I was like, mm. <laughs> Our put the balance Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, this is great. Looking good. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute for that. Yeah, I'm not sure if he's on the We're just waiting for the thesis chair who was practicing one minute ago. Come and sit down here if you want. I'm about to. They just finished on Miguel's presentations. No, you know, the way that the practice is, you know, it's like, you know,
I have a thought you're going to get something that's out of all of you, even just with stuff like this, so I feel better about the more about the I'll respond a little later. Yeah, just talk to you. I just talk to you. I said all three, three options. Yeah. Uh, I would say anybody. All right, everybody, we're ready for our second presentation of the day. <laughs> All right, our second presentation of the day. After this, we'll have a short break. We'll turn the boards um, for the second half of the morning. So whenever you're ready. Good morning. My name is Marcelino, and today I will be presenting Marketing Anacostia, which is a project that seeks to create a public heart in the Anacostia neighborhood of Southeast DC to address the ongoing latest development and the lack of healthy foods. So this thesis aims to create a public heart for Anacostia by using an urban market as a catalyst for, for, for future public gatherings and healthy living. There are ultimately four main design objectives, which is to popularize transit, establish healthy commerce, provide place-based resources, and sustain walkable connections. Ultimately, these goals are attained through urban and building approach strategies. But before we get into the more systematic nature of this project, I realize some background information is needed. So you might ask why Anacostia of all places? Well, for quite some time now, Anacostia has been listed by the DC Office of Zoning as something that's called a high opportunity zone, which are generally low income areas that have the highest potential for future development. The ultimate goal behind declaring a place as a high opportunity zone is to attract investors to boost economic growth and job creations. Oops. Because of this, there has been a lasting redevelopment campaign in Anacostia. Although it is operated with great intentions, these development efforts have shifted the community's character and obscured local businesses and neighborhoods from the public eye. As a consequence, Anacostia really doesn't have a public center or anything civic for that matter to, do, to unify the new development with the existing community. One of the targeted areas in Anacostia is the neighborhood of Berry Farm. For those of us who are unfamiliar, Berry Farm is a historically African-American neighborhood that has long provided co-housing for its residents. But because of the increasing development efforts, it was eventually purchased and demolished for reconstruction. All of its original residents have either moved out or have been relocated around the district in order for excavation and groundbreaking to begin. While Berry Farm has suffered from the impacts of municipal neglect and invasive welfare policies, it also has a profoundly rich history. The, this act of removal is an unfortunate yet common problem in most high opportunity zones. The second biggest issue and concerns to Anacostia is that it is a food desert, 
which is an area that has limited access to affordable and nutritious foods. There are many types of stores within the area, but they don't sell the necessary essentials that are needed in a healthy lifestyle. The majority of these stores range from corner stores to convenience stores, liquor shops, and small fast food restaurants. Basically anything that is unhealthy, it's there. But there is no real major grocery store that offers healthy and fresh foods for the community. So you might ask, how does using an urban market solve these issues? Besides their profitable nature, urban markets are not just places of commerce, they are civic centers. What sets urban markets apart from dispersed retail is that they operate in shared public spaces, serve locally owned businesses, and have their own public goals. Take, for example, the Eastern Market located in Capitol Hill, DC. This is a precedent that is successful for its use of indoor and outdoor spaces that are available for rent and usage. This market's array of seasonal programs, affordable stall rentals, and its newly renovated interior lends the space its bustling and inclusive public atmosphere. Urban markets can also vary in building skill. In the case of the Budapest market, the majority of its success stems from the size of its building footprint. Because it's so large, the market is able to host a variety of spaces within its interior. On the ground floor, there are airy stalls that sell a variety of fresh produce, local foods, and other products in high demand. Then on the upper floor, there are, there are more general merchandise products like sweets, snacks, and souvenirs. This collective focus on the public good and aspiration to unify both flourishing and declining economies is what Anacostia needs given the recent development efforts. On that note, the proposed market is envisioned to be situated at the Anacostia Metro Station along Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue and Howard Road. This site was chosen primarily for its connective opportunity between the commercial realm along Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue and the residential realm of Berry Farm. It will later be examined how the market will connect the two of these realms as well as how it responds architecturally to the newer developments that occur within them. From a three-dimensional perspective, the site sits as a nexus between the two realms, giving it a centralized feel and an optimal spot for creating a public art. It also becomes apparent that there are a few important buildings within the site, uh, the site boundary. The first is the existence of the United House of Prayer Church, which sits next to the central metro station, as you can kind of see in that diagram. The second would be the Thurgood Marshall Academy, an important charter school in the District of Columbia. When approaching the site from Martin Luther King Avenue, we start to see a declining experience in the public atmosphere. The placement of the metro station between Thurgood Marshall Academy and the United House of Prayer Church, those buildings that I mentioned before, makes the area very difficult to enjoy leisurely. In addition, the metro station itself is incredibly mediocre, with nothing but a blank concrete wall that faces the Howard Road. The entrance to the metro is only visible if we are standing in the bus soup that is behind the station. Moving into the analysis of the urban fabric, the site itself appears as frugal and delicate, with nothing solid in its building establishment to help define the selected site boundary. When analyzing the site's urban blocks, we see an irregular patterning of the city grid. Starting east of the site, the blocks appear smaller and more finely grained, eventually transitioning into larger plots as we progress west. Some important bordering features to the site include major streets that offer ease of access to the property. These arteries constrain the site to its current form, especially Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue, which you can see on that, the, the right side of that diagram, and Sweetland Parkway, which is south of the site. There is also the existence of Shannon Place Southeast, which is conveniently centered to the existing metro station and to a local, a local road across Sweetland Parkway and Berry Farm. If we took a closer look at this in section, and we were to define the character of one of these streets, we would, re we would realize that most of these streets are either very narrow and, and thoroughfare or very congested in nature. But because of that congested nature and the development of newer buildings occurring along that edge, there is an opportunity to make it a very walkable site. As mentioned before, the site is situated between many areas of ongoing development where the larger targets of new development occur west and south of the metro station. As you can see, Berry Farm, which is number one on that diagram, is one of those targeted areas. You'll also, no you'll also notice that the site sits at the epicenter of all the ongoing development that contributes to the public heart aspect of this thesis. In terms of building use, the site has an imbalance between buildings that are residential or commercial in nature. You'll notice how the residential buildings heavily outweigh their commercial counterparts, revealing the lack of a great and clear public space. 
In addition, we also discovered that there are very few commercial properties and grocery stores that sell that actually sell healthy foods and essentials. But as this area grows in the, street, in the future, with all the development go going on, it will need more food choices. The site itself has an opportunity to become a walkable place if there are efforts in the near future to make it accessible to pedestrians. When looking at the site at a larger scale, most of the major landmarks like Anacostia Park, Berry Farm, and the Frederick Douglass House are only 10 to 15 minutes away. If made accessible through certain planning strategies, any city dweller can reach those a lot of places within reasonable times. In addition to being a nexus of the commercial and residential realms, the site itself also sits at the center of several green parks. Each of these parks is within walking distance of each other and can be reached from the site if there are efforts to improve pedestrian experiences. Topographically speaking, the site's grading is largely constant. It slopes slightly in one direction and there isn't much elevational change across its surface. This reduces the risk of flooding from the Anacostia River and any other challenges related to grade change. As viewed from the aerial perspective, the location also contains a bus loop with one of the metro stations on the Green Line. Therefore, choosing to establish a market within this site increases the chance of additional visitors using public transit within and outside of Anacostia. Ultimately, these existing site conditions create a nexus within Anacostia that is highly accessible, publicly visible, and environmentally undisturbed. From this analysis stems an opportunity to connect the existing metro station and its allotted parcel to other residential and commercial realms. These are ideal conditions for an urban market that seeks to become a major public heart. Moving into the urban approach of this thesis, it was found that the ideal location of the proposed market should be at the metro station. It was also found to be better if the market was built as an integrated gemstone, where it sits between the existing United House of Prayer Church and the department, a newly proposed apartment building. Doing this adds value to the church and avoids major demolition plans. When planning the urban scheme, the project was divided into several components, with each component achieving the objectives to popularize transit, establish healthy commerce, provide place-based resources, and sustain a walkable connection between the market and the local community. Beginning west of the site, there is Howard Plaza, which is a shared congregation space used for large outdoor events, such as seasonal farmer's market or a flea market. This plaza contains a central amphitheater with retail on the lower floors and seating at the upper platform to look into either the plaza, the plaza itself or to Sweetland Parkway. Howard Plaza changes its uses during the season, which gives its visitors the, the ability to experience the full extent of the public atmosphere on any given day. For instance, perhaps during Christmas Eve, there might be a large gathering of some sort for all locals of Anacostia to celebrate the winter holidays. Or perhaps in the summer, the annual flea market takes place, offering cheap and affordable goods to all. Shifting right, we see the loggia, which is on the western end of the market. The loggia contains outdoor seating, casual dining spaces, and a passageway to the metro station. This loggia is also attached to a pedestrian bridge at the upper level to connect Berry Farm to the market itself. This pedestrian bridge achieves the first objective of sustaining walkable connections. It is connected to Berry Farm with the intention that new and old residents of the neighborhood can quickly cross Sweetland Parkway to go shopping or to catch the next metro while experiencing a fully lit and ventilated walk. Last but not least, there is the market building itself, which is the central part of this thesis that holds all the indoor spaces and private amenities necessary in creating that public heart. Several phases helped compose the overall form of the market. The first phase was to maximize its allowable building footprint above the metro station. The second phase consisted of dividing the mass based on the building program and the pedestrian bridge. The third and final phase involved distinguishing these volumes and raising them <clears throat> to assign them to eventually assign them different roof lines, which you can see from the raised cylindrical metro tower and the gabled roofed market hall. When entering the market from Howard Road, the relationship between roofline and building program becomes really apparent. The repeated gable rooflines help indicate the sequential bays that are dedicated to either the loggia, central market hall, or the side wings. However, if one entered the market from Howard Plaza, they would instead see the facade relationship between the pedestrian bridge and the loggia, where the bridge slowly blends itself into the western wing of the market. The intention behind the series of arches is to communicate a sense of civic purpose, while offering visibility into the market hall indoors. 
In regards to the building program, the market is broken down into four categories, congregation, emporium, service, and private amenities. With the help of these categories, they achieve all the design objectives to promote transportation, establish healthy commerce, provide place-based resources to sustain walkable connections. For, for congregation, it consists of the previously discussed urban components, Howard Plaza, the Loja, and the amphitheater. Each of these spaces in their own right are attractive to the public eye. This garners the attention of nearby residents and triggers an influx of visitors benefiting the vendors in the market, the Vetro station and the plaza as a whole during social events. For the Emporium program, these spaces are split into two parts, the Market Hall and the Western Wing. The Western Wing is fitted with casual dining spaces such as cafes and bars across two floors. The Market Hall, on the other hand, is a tall atrium space that has vendor booths at the ground level selling their products. Vendors will conduct much of their business here, which encourages competitive sales and attracts commuters entering in from the Metro line. To accommodate for the employees, we must of course have program dedicated to service. Most of these spaces dedicated to service were pushed into the Eastern wing of the market to avoid mixing with the more public areas of the building. And last but not least, there is the private amenities. For the private amenities, the building has enclosed spaces for visitors to rent out. They may use these spaces for events like award ceremonies, community related celebrations or other social venues. This program also addresses the needs of local students and workers by including private study rooms and we work spaces. Because of the anticipated noise coming from the market hall, all of these rooms were put in the, the Eastern Wing with the intention that it would be a quieter end of the building. Back on the ground floor, the market hall exposes spaces on an open floor plan that would be appropriate for visitors coming off the metro station. These types of spaces include a cafe and a snack bar to accommodate a typical metro commuter seeking quick sustenance. The hall is also arranged into base to take in people from the primary entrances that occur along the northern and the western facade. Towards the central part of the halls are stalls dedicated to local vendors selling popular things like fresh produce, baked goods, staple goods, and other products in high demand. In order to help the vendor continue their business and fulfill the second goal of creating healthy commerce, these market stalls were designed for long-term use. Furthermore, with the seasonal occupation of Howard Plaza, there is also the opportunity to use that outdoor plaza as a temporary place for an occasional farmer's market. Since most of the shopping activity is done on the ground floor, a person standing in the central market hall views the entirety of its space and its majesty. Not only can they see how the market work, but they can also see when the next Metro line is coming from the large display screens, which you can kind of see in the background there, <clears throat> that hang from the trusses above the building. This allows a, a typical Metro rail commuter to keep track of their time while shopping around in the market building itself. At the upper level, the parallel placement of the Western and the Eastern wings allows both sides to look into the market below or to their respective plazas and parks next door. Because of the connective nature of the loggia, the Western wing was designed to be more transparent with glazing on all sides facing the Metro station, the Central Market Hall and Howard Plaza. Not only that, both wings are connected by an upper level platform to allow people to traverse across the market hall at a higher level. This gangplank mirrors the, the same user experience of the market hall for someone standing at the ground floor. This gangplank also eventually leads the visitors to the Eastern side of the market where they may rent one of the private rentable spaces. All of these private rentable spaces have visibility into the market hall, exposing them to the bustling and inclusive public atmosphere at the ground level. In terms of tectonics, the central market hall is vertically continuous. Because of the site orientation, the roof was granted skylights on faces that would receive the majority of ambient lighting. On the contrary, the western wing is split into two floors to match the height of the pedestrian bridge and loggia outside. Finally, the eastern wing is more deliberately stacked to maximize the total number of private rentable spaces and we work rooms. In short, Anacostia is both a high opportunity zone and a food desert. To make up for the negative effects of development and the lack of good, green, healthy foods, there needs to be an urban market. An urban market will serve as a significant public area that welcomes both new and longtime residents, bridging the gap between surrounding development and older neighborhoods. It will also subsequently provide a substantial amount of healthy produce and other edible merchandise to an area that is deprived of such things. This now concludes the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your time, and I open up the floor to questions and comments.
Um, wow. And this is a, such a cool project. Um, and I know, I know this metro station pretty well. And I, I, you really need to have the microphone in the reviewer's face. We can't hear it without that. You could probably use mine. Here. Maybe hold it. Oh, Alec, that's all I'm going to do is Hello? complain that you oh, did There you go. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear you, Brian. What did you say? I said, that's all I ever do is complain about things that you're doing. I'm sorry, Alec. I'm, I'm used to it. It's fine. <laughs> okay, buddy. <laughs> anyway, so I was just saying this is a really cool project. Um, there's so many things about it that I like. I, I think the, the first part that resonates a lot with me is just the fact that you landed this thing directly on the Metro. You know, I, I think in a lot of cases, you know, someone else looking at this might have set the building next to it or, you know, and I think the idea that you've created this place where people come into something that's important and then the way that it kind of immediately connects you with, um, you know, the, the rest of the city, the rest of Anacostia, the Berry Farms connection, um, you know, even the quality of the architecture. Initially, when I was kind of squinting with my bad eyesight from the uh, back of the room, I was thinking maybe it's a little too traditional, but I, there's something about the way that you've kind of used this kind of market hall, you know, tradition, and then you there is this kind of infusion of something new. I, th I think perhaps you could have taken that a little bit further, but the quality of the thinking and the layout of the the program and the relationships to the adjacent properties and like this would work. And I also think that, you know, it's, it's rare, maybe not that rare. Uh, Maryland is a really good school as an alum to see projects that you'd want to go to. I would love to visit this building. And I, I think it's, it's impressive. Thank so I'll, that. I'll stop gushing and let somebody else talk. It's funny that you mentioned that I, I currently work at a firm and I chose this site or this area, particularly because we do all of our work within that area. So I kind of knew the site a little bit more prior to choosing it. Um, but thank you. Thank you for the, the feedback. Okay, I want to challenge you just a little bit here. What grades go to the charter school that's across the street? I think it's uh, an elementary school. So it's actually split up into two of that. I don't know if you can see, but that L, upside down L shape or mm -hmm. half under whatever U shape, that's the, the charter school. The building that's above that is another part of the school, the Savoy Elementary School. So I have a, I have a suspicion that they're both for elementary school students. Elementary school students. Yes, okay. they, they, they actually have um, a playground where this, this newly proposed building is um, in addition to like a, a black court for a blacktop court for basketball. So I'm, I, I was under the suspicion that it was for elementary school students. Okay, but that's a, it's attached to the school. Yes. And then what's the residential and kind of demographic makeup of the people who live in the areas surrounding your site? Not the redeveloped portions, but yep. the existing portions. I'm glad you asked that. Um, I do have it in my appendix. So uh, around 98 to 99% of it is all black. The graphics are all black. What's the age? What's the, the family makeup? The I age promise of, I'm going somewhere with yeah, it. Yeah, it's around, <laughs> it says it's around 33 to 40. So. 33 to 40. Yeah. So I'm assuming there's a chance that these people have kids too? Absolutely. Okay. Where do the kids play in your development? It's a good question. So here's the thing. I agree. I like what you've done. I like the architectural expression of what you've done. Yeah. I see where you're trying to maybe in some ways combat new development and how it leads to kind of these big box name, name brand kind of less uh, connected vendors and situations, yeah. but you've created a public heart mm -hmm. that is centered around people coming to spend money, right? Right. They're either traveling somewhere, they're spending money at a vendor, 
or they are renting a private space or they're doing some work. And I think what's been like bothering me just a little bit about this thesis is that where's the spontaneous interaction with the community and this development? Right. Where does the single mom or just any mom on Saturday who's like, I just don't want to be in the house with this kid come to do something and not have to spend $60, $70 in order to get it done. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're like on the right track, but I really want to see a acknowledgement of a heart as not just a place to go to specific activities, but a place that also encourages spontaneous interaction with the development, which leads to spontaneous interaction with your neighbors and maybe can start to combat some of this isolationism that we're seeing in um, society these days. Right. Um, I, I don't think this is too traditional in terms of architecture, actually. I really like it and appreciate that it really, really, really plays on what we consider more traditional. I really like the form of the building. Like I could imagine walking through here and really enjoying it. And yeah. in some ways, like wanting to go up and down the stairs and across the bridges. And it's like a little bit of a maze. Yeah. Um, I just want to see that one piece that I feel is missing in terms of more social kind of connection. Yeah, absolutely. I got something to that. Um, well, first of all, thank you again. This is a, a real tour de force. I think it's uh, first time I do uh, these reviews at UMD. I'm like blown away at the scale thank and you. purpose of your project, the both projects I've seen so far. So kudos to you for taking that on in the space of what, two semesters? Yeah, that, that's extraordinary. I think this project has a clarity and a uh, maturity to it that I think are... Um, very commendable in and of itself. Uh, I admire that you were able to work on the master plan uh, while at the same time diving deeper into the market and really like fantastic resolution. I totally buy it. Yeah. Uh, it works. It's a very interesting idea. To to the, the last comment, I think, uh, and this is more like a provocation because I just said that you took on so much, but what I see here is an enormous potential for future development, not the end of something, yeah. but the beginning. And I think the the um, the way this um, idea becomes a catalyst that propagates on the site with more programs and with more connectors, and we kind of actualize in that idea of the walkability uh, and the green space that you've been mentioning. I, I'm looking forward to seeing it because I think you've already thought about it. Yeah. You have like granular information about what's going on in the demographics and the economy of the area. I, I would totally go ahead and do this. Is like, I, I would also like publish this project because there's so much here that deserves to be heard. Um, but maybe as a one question and provocation for you is what, uh, and to, to the last question as well, how would you go about um, for lack of a better description, making it more inclusive to the local community. Yeah, so there was actually a, we had like a guest lecture for somebody, actually several residents of Berry Farm, so the neighborhood that's south of our site. They did a little um, a documentary video and I was actually there to ask them a few questions. I was, to, you know, to notify them that I was doing this thesis and I asked them, I was like, what, from somebody that's doing something that's more related to the more commercial and public side of architecture, and, you know, Berry Farms is all residential. Um, what can I do personally to sort of include that population of people that actually live within Berry Farms and have that history of being there for such a long time? And their answer to me was that listening was like a prime factor and that, you know, trying to get the opinions of each and every one of the residents, you know, with their children, you know, their grandparents, they have a long lineage of a family tree within Berry Farms. And so it was very difficult to get in contact with any of these people because most of them have moved out already. And um, I think that's that's sort of what led me to, to kind of frame the intent of this thesis more so around the middle-aged group of people, more so than the children and people that are single moms or they have full-on families. But yes, to answer your question, I would, I think my my next step would probably to go and you know to track these people down and to sort of ask them 
personally, you know, what, what would help benefit you if we were to establish something as public and as great as this? But thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you. This there's there's so um there's a lot of different levels this project can be critiqued or discussed on. And just, you know, um it it's I'm a little bit between the master planning piece and the architecture piece, because I think um I think you focused a lot on like the design of a market hall and like yeah. a very real building. And it's you know, it's very believable. And I think like the are you know, I, I like the fact that you kind of chose an architectural language that related to like some of the history of the, of the site and surrounding areas. Um, and uh, not what's there today, but what, you know, might have been there in the past that's gone or some of the, some of the typical kinds of structures that you also like would find in um, like in the, this, yeah, for lack of a better, the Southeast sort of yeah. quadrant. Right. Um, and I grew up by the way in forest Heights, which is just oh, okay. over the line. Yep um and went to oxen hill senior high school and i know this area really really well yeah <laughs> um so um so i think there's i think there's that level where there's just you know this is this is a, a very believable workable building um it's funny because we did a project for essex crossing yeah. which is nine city blocks in the lower east side that's anchored by a food market yeah. um that was a project where the city owned the site they worked with the community for eight years i think to before they even put out the RFP. So by the time we got the RFP and we were teamed in a public private with a developer to do the master plan, it was like, we we kind of, it was, it was so well done with the groundwork that was laid that it was just a matter of kind of giving form to that and the developer kicking in the right number, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but you know, we have the connection of the subway that comes up into the market hall. You have, you know, and I just wanna say about the community involvement there, there was a required community community facility piece, which wound up being a test kitchen. That's what, you know, sort of a, you know, that's, there's a community facility kitchen there. They do food education. Um, I'll do all through um, COVID. Uh, there was a group um, when it's still running now, but uh, called heart of dinner that wound up using the building and the test kitchen as the site where they, um, they work, they partner with local restaurants and farms yeah. to package fresh meals for elderly shut in Asians who couldn't get out during COVID. So it was, it became this whole real heart of the community. And if you go there after school, all the kids in the neighborhood are there, they're hanging out, they're having a snack, they're doing their homework. So I think, I think that there can be, as long as you have like the set aside space and the intent, and it's, it's really almost more of a, like, um, it's an operational and uh, incentive you know, like this was this was incentivized by the city. It was a requirement for the developer to provide these spaces for the community. And it was some and it was asked for by the community. So it was kind of baked into it, right? This isn't a private development that someone did just for profit, which would be very different, probably. So I guess from the planning standpoint, then flipping to that, and I'm curious because this is just so real, mm -hmm. um, like who owns this site and how would it actually how would you create, and, and maybe this is beyond the level of what you have to do here, yeah. but, but I feel like to get, I feel like to get what you want out of this, it really almost needs to be a piece of a larger master plan where you've got the density of the development to support it and you've, and you provide, and you know, because this is very expensive to build and it would yes. be very hard to have a private developer build this and bring in, you know, and they would have to, it would, it would have to be brought in. Then you have to go out and get like the, who's going to pay for this, right? They'd need an anchor tenant. It would need to be like Whole Foods or somebody, right? Yeah. I don't know who you have here, if there's another grocery store, but like, it's really hard to get those grocery stores to go into these neighborhoods where they don't feel like there's enough um, density and, and income levels to support it. Like they don't want to come, which is yeah. why, um, which is why, in, like, I think I almost see this, this is needing to be you know, like a, a required subsidized kind of piece of the infrastructure that then winds up being supported and it, it attracts develop, it attracts people to the area because it's an amenity, but then it also needs to get supported by the density of the area. I think putting it on the Metro is brilliant because otherwise when I saw that, I was like, oh, this could actually work because it could get foot traffic from people, not just in that area, but people coming through who are like, I'm going to pop out and go grab my, my, my takeaway for home, you know? And right. then, so, so I could see that actually working. Um, they use, they use that metric. Mm -hmm. like, like, yeah. 
coming in. Yeah, that's critical, critical having the foot foot traffic. And I, I just want to, real quick what you said. One of the things I think is missing for me, one of the things I think is missing for me based on the comment that was just made is a explanation of what the development at Berry Farms and across the street actually include. Because I think that if you had outlined what that stuff is, it might have actually got in front of the comment that was just made about having enough density. And maybe that's where the whole foods go, right? right? And so you don't need to include that in your site, but until you acknowledge all that stuff is already coming anyways, it's hard to kind of ignore it. Thanks, I, I'm gonna open with a provocative question for you. So what is the, what is the biggest asset of this site? As in, like, what exists wise? now that's its biggest asset? That's a question that I've been thinking myself. I, I used to think it was like the market hall, but I kind of made no, it no, no. Currently, currently, there's nothing on the site. I mean, wh wh where where it is today? What's its biggest asset? It's not. Uh, I mean, I'll answer it for you. The obvious answer is the right answer. The metro station. Yeah, the metro. <laughs> So, um, so what I'm going to talk about is related to that, um, because I think you have a very strong project here, and I think that it starts really with this, yep. the the access to Berry Farm, and the fact that that lands right at the metro station. I think that's a very strong idea, and really works. But what I would challenge you to do graphically, and I and I think it's sort of here, but we can't see it. First of all, I would put a big giant M where the metro is, because I had to keep reading that tiny little font to understand where the metro actually is. That's your asset, right? So it's a little like the last project when I was talking about the park. Yep. Let's start with the asset and work backwards from that. Gotcha. So I would expect to see a bunch of perspectives down into that station and what it's like immediately around it. Because I don't really understand that from your drawings. Right. I, I can imagine it and I can imagine that you're skillful enough to make it work, yeah. but it's really, really important. Because that, if you look at the site today, that's where everybody hangs out, right? Yep. I mean, you know, between the United House of Prayer and the Metro Station in that, in literally your site. Um, we're, we've done a lot of work at St. Elizabeth's. We're, we're doing a building at Stork in Acostia right now. So we're very familiar with this neighborhood. We're also, we're here on a whole bunch of markets. <laughs> so, um, so you're going to get a little bit of everything. Um, so at the level of the, so that, that's the sort of graphic thing. At the level of architecture, I look at the kind of big square plan and wonder why it isn't more eroded. It's it's a big square plan. You know, the, the wall on Howard Road is flat. Right. Um, I really wonder why it is flat and why there might be, you know, some kind of, this might be cut out mm -hmm. so that you get a little more expression of the market and you get a lot more street place for people to hang out. Right. And then what that would do would, would be to let the Metro station be open on three sides, which I think would probably help it. So there's that. And then the other thing I would question you about is the Eastern wing. Um, I think the Eastern wing shouldn't be the same as the market hall. I question the top two floors of the Eastern wing. Um, partly because United House of Prayer, as weird, weird as it is, is a much lower scale building and it's really a crucial community asset. And, you know, that church has been the font of all kinds of development. So they're a, you know, really important thing here. And, and they feel a little shunted off to the side here with the loading dock and the, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Yeah, the, the existing site. And the really tall building next to it, you know. Right, the existing site had the bus loop um, exit right. out on the, the left -hand side of the, the church. So I, so I think architecturally it would be stronger if the eastern wing were different, were lower, and then you really celebrate the middle, yeah. which, is, which is your market. And, you know, I think, you know, your planning in general is really good, really strong. 
um, hard to do these buildings. They're, they're very complicated. Um, so, it, I mean, it's a great project. It, it really is. But again, sort of start with your assets. So if I were presenting this, I would start with that big giant M for the Metro station. Then I would show this access you have across Suitland Parkway. Yep. And then I would see how everything else attaches to that. And that's all in this project, but you need to show it. Gotcha. I'm going to echo some of the previous comments. I, I think um, the urban design and the kind of the programming and the, the broad planning strokes make a lot of sense. And it's really exciting. I think this would be a great asset to the community of Anacostia. Um, as Ralph mentioned, we, we, we've we been fortunate to kind of work with Congress Heights and the Anacostia community in previous projects. And um, I think one thing this project could, you know, as you further develop it is uh, kind of look at, I think, outreach to the community and just kind of understanding the community. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, Ward, Ward 8 is one of the youngest uh, wards in the city by average age, you know, that you have an unusual density of elementary, middle schools, high, you know, just yeah. school, schools. And I, when I look at kind of the project overall, it makes sense, but it kind of is appealing to me. But if I'm, you know, I'm trying to imagine if I'm a 14 year old coming home from yeah. high school, hanging out with my friends, is this a place that, you know, is tailored to me or just kind of, it, it, am I the primary audience here, right. you know, just kind of. I'm not sure it, it kind of hits that. And I think you can overlay, you know, a lot of details. You know, I, I would note that um, some of the highest bus uh, usage rates are here, right here. Uh, some of the highest um, bike usage rates are right here. Um, and, and I think a lot of that is re reflective of, you know, the, the, young, the young kids and like, you know, they're hanging out there. They're, they're, they really, uh, you know, have their mark on this community. And so I think, you know, just kind of tailoring the design really, Kind of focusing on some of these details and overlaying, um, uh, you know, it's not, it's not like making it kid friendly, but it's more of like inviting to kind of a broader swath of users. Thank you. I absolutely want to go here um, and it feels very real. Um, one thing that I think is really prominent in your, your graphics, um, now serving half smokes, that kind of beacon. I'm kind of wondering what the program is. Um, and maybe the, the program isn't as prominent as, as it is represented graphically. What, what's the idea for that? So that's just at, uh, access way into the metro station below. We, I ended yeah. up raising up that tower just to sort of call out the metro station. So that way it appears very unique and facade and massing. So that's where you want that M. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that was, <laughs> got it. Uh, thank you. I slow on the uptake there. Um, I, yeah, I, I really like how you've kind of um, done the congregation forum service and private amenities. I think you started to be thoughtful about the United House of Prayer, which is this like really, um, it's a landmark and um, churches are really sensitive to what gets built next to them because of the light that they get during worship. And so um, just thinking, you know, if the, the next iteration of this would probably need to tre treat that really sensitively. Um, I don't know how their windows are situated. That's not part of your study, but um, just from personal experience working with churches, they really don't want to mess up the light that they get on Sundays or kind of the circulation and like where people gather outside of the church. Um, so I think you've you've started to 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 look at that thoughtfully. Um, I think to the earlier comment about where do kids go, um, sometimes kids just go wherever they want to go, <laughs> and I can see them in and through and I think um you know up on it and yell you know yelling at each other whatever like that's what in in the sense of like a mall like I would have hung out in the 90s 80s um so being sensitive to like that that like they kind of flow like like gas not you know a solid <laughs> um so thinking about how they're going to use that space I think is really and, and kids of all ages right um so that's my the last of my comments thank you and really beautiful. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Mars, this is so fun to see. I mean, the amount that you've done just in the last month is really impressive. Um, congratulations. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at this and thinking what a fantastic space, as everyone has said. Um, and you have 20 market stalls. Is that is that enough? It, I mean. <laughs> like, how, how did you determine that? Was it a size-based thing or, uh, you know, is there some kind of metric that farmers markets and market hall people use to determine the number of stalls? 
on the one hand versus I was wondering if Corey could weigh in on that too from the development side. Yeah, I mean, this could be, this would wind up in, sorry, I, I, I feel like in reality, this would wind up getting much more densely packed. You know, I could see like even keeping the high ceilings, you could have mezzanine levels. Yeah. At Essex Market, we have the main level, there's the mezzanine levels. We also, they they did it in kind of a smart way. They had they had the plan for like the main area that they were able to fill. And then the second <laughs> actually additional vendor stalls at the level of the subway. So when you come out, I mean, not on the subway tracks, but you come, you know, you come up from the subway and you're literally in um, an area with vendor stalls. And then, um, and it's actually like two different tiers because one is like city owned and one is developer owned. I don't know, there's like a little bit difference. At, at Essex Market, we actually had like a lot of local vendors going, I mean, it, it was a very food centered community to begin with, like going all the way back to, you know, post-war Russian immigrants. So we still had Russ and Daughters, which is like bagels and gefilte fish and, you know, all the way up through, you know, Latin American, Asian, um, you know, uh, like all different cuisines. Like, and so that was really important to bring those into the market. So there were a lot of existing, there was existing vendors that just came straight in off the street and we wanted to keep like that character um, of them. So there's a lot of the design that addresses that, but then there was also just other space that was built out that like, this will come later. Right. Um, and so it did, it, it, it was, it was designed to be able to accommodate additional density, even though we didn't have all the vendors like on day one in the space. Um, and so it, you would definitely want more. Yeah. Um, Brian, here. Okay. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to say that, uh, Actually, one of the things that we really never really engaged was the uh, the lower level, the potential to 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 connect with the metro. In a way, we we're sort of uh, approaching that as sort of being sacrosanct, and we probably should have been taking some more liberties with thinking about uh, a, a ground plane that's uh, closer down by the metro. Anyhow, I just want to say that to, that one of the aspects of this project that really impressed me the the um, the whole time through was the way in which Marcelino was able to um, generate a series of urban tactical solutions um, and really sort of exhaust the, the, the number of different possibilities. And then at the same time, work through a, a, a series of uh, incredible um, uh, diverse um, approaches to the actual building. The building ha has been cooking for a long time. It's been through many different iterations and um, every time that um, Professor Bell or I would, would sort of slam him on, on a particular aspect of the building and sort of pick himself back up and dust himself off and get back to work on it. So uh, it's been a pleasure working with you, Marcelino. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> well, Mars, um, congratulations. This is really a terrific showing and very well conceived. And sorry, I was a little bit late, everybody. I was giving a final and I thought I was gonna be able to escape a little earlier than I did. Um, you know how it is with with giving finals. The students are always panicked. Anyhow, um, but we're here and you're here and this is great. And Mars, I have to thank you. They're the first thesis committee I've ever served on for a Micronesian. So that's <laughs> noteworthy for me. Um, <laughs> which is he told me all about Micronesia. I never knew much about it. Um, but one of the things about Mars that you know, the completeness of this is at one level kind of astonishing from the urban conception and things. And you know, I think the criticism people made about talking about what kind of density is going on, there's a fair point just in terms of numbers. There is an immense amount of development activity happening around here. Berry Farm, over 2,000 units that of single-family uh, townhouses and multifamily buildings. The Howard Road development in, in, in the historic district, we see on the HPRB in D.C. every time we see new development. And one of the challenges of Anacostia, and your firm's been doing a lot of it, one of the challenges of Anacostia is change because there are people there who always come and testify and say, well, Anacostia is just two- and three-story buildings, and we should keep it that way. But, you know, we're never really going to solve the housing crisis and all the livability crises we have if we keep that as a mentality. So we're always trying to sort of push on, well, in actual fact, compatibility isn't just about height. You can have taller buildings that are compatible. And I think this thesis, you know, even though it's not technically in the historic district, I don't think, um, it, it does, begins to suggest that, yeah, Anacostia is a place where it could see levels of development that are similar to what you see in other parts of D.C. 
And that's happening. We, we need the residential development. We need the amenities. These communities need things like this. One thing that, that Mars didn't quite point out that I think is also a very important part of the program that didn't start out this way is the community spaces at the second floor. This idea that you can have a market like this, but also places for people to meet and have, you know, the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts and the cooking class and whatever it is and a cafe up there. That's, that's really um, a terrific way to kind of find space in a thesis and be able to adapt it to what you're doing, which is good because it, part of an architectural education is a, is a high tolerance for ambiguity. In other words, the program is never really fixed, right? You're always looking for things you can add and things you can take advantage of. And what I was always admired about that is your willingness, and, you know, Brian or Julia, I would say, well, maybe maybe you should think about this up there. The next thing you know, Mars would come back with a whole idea about that. So a little bit working with Mars, even though, He's Micronesian. It's a little bit like pushing a snowball off a hill. And it, these ideas snowball in such a brilliant way. And I got to say, Mars, I'm really impressed. And I'm impressed with the, all the different scales. I'm impressed with your incredible ability, your eclectic ability to go from something like that to this room here. This is the same guy, by the way, who designed this and designed that and the facade there and the facade there. He has incredible dexterity and ability to adapt things. And somehow it all seems to come together, which is kind of an amazing thing. So congratulations, Mars. We're, we're really excited about this. And I definitely could see this adding to civic life in Anacostia. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a five minute break to turn the boards. If you are a current thesis student, especially if you have already presented, now is your time to shine. Lend a hand, turn the boards for your classmates. Thank you.
Is this Westport? No, Westport's all too close. Ah, okay. But when you surf Westport without uh without something after it, can I think it's always well yeah. Oh, I'm the circus clown. Okay, if you can hear this and you're on the jury, please make your way back. And if you can hear this and you're a student or a visitor. Hey, Corey. Hey, Callie. It's time. Please join us. It's time. Let's go. <laughs> Okay, we have two more presentations in our morning session. Um, we'll be here and then we'll be here. Um, we'll take a one hour break after that. The faculty and um, jurors will go to the offices um, and then we'll be back here at two. So that's the kind of plan for the rest of the day. Um, and so whenever you're ready, go for it. All right. So hi everyone, my name is Danielle A.B. I'm a dual degree student with architecture and community planning. And I'd like to start with a quick thank you to some people before we start. Thank you to my friends and family for always having more confidence in me than I ever do in myself. Thank you to my peers for all of the collective support that I felt this, sem this semester. Um, and thank you to my committee for believing in this project so much. And thank you finally to my chair, Ken, for the unrelenting positive energy that I needed and for somehow being able to know what I mean, even when I'm just struggling to get my thoughts into words like every meeting. So this is Harboring Identity, a community informed design for belonging in Westport and Curtis Bay. So this is about listening, empathizing and starting the design process with the communities and then exploring forms and spaces that can serve community anchors and community needs while acknowledging some complicated histories. The design intent is to empower residents to stay, strengthen, and feel a sense of belonging in their home neighborhoods. First, I feel the need to answer the question that might be on some of your minds right now, which is why are you doing a thesis on two neighborhoods? Why would you do that? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I know. Uh, many of the needs and histories here are specific problems to these communities, yes, but there are commonalities and patterns that emerge when multiple communities are in the mix. And I'd venture to say that these commonalities would also emerge in other South Baltimore waterfront adjacent neighborhoods too. So this entire approach of becoming familiar with multiple communities to understand a slightly more broad context of need becomes something that could be used to reveal patterns in other historically and or geographically similar areas. So the goal here is not to solve a community, but rather to empathize and for residents to feel a sense of belonging, of belonging in their home neighborhood and of the neighborhood belonging to them. So yes, it's a lot. Um, it, this is not one building, this is six interventions. It's complex, but so are these neighborhoods. And there's value to looking at it at this scale, trying to map the hearts of the neighborhoods and get to know what residents see as necessary to their sense of belonging. They are the context experts. And this is the amount of intervention that could be a starting point from my perspective as the designer having done this research. Um, so one lens I want us to be looking through before we get to know these neighborhoods, is the effects of redlining in Baltimore and the ways in which durable inequalities have caused environmental, economic, and health issues in many neighborhoods. South Baltimore was given a C rating during the redlining process in 1938 due to the neighborhood's black and immigrant communities. With the label definitely declining, loans for property maintenance, mortgages, and other large expenses were unavailable to residents. The association between the population and the land uses was not a matter of income compatibility with industry, but one of immigrants and people of color being seen as compatible uses to industry. The health risks and disinvestment risks were not unknown. They were calculated, 
ignored and allowed to worsen. That this investment of resources can sometimes be followed by reinvestment once the prices are low, and this leads to this can lead to physical and or cultural displacement of longtime residents. So physical displacement would be getting like literally priced out of your neighborhood due to the rents increasing. Cultural displacement is feeling like there's not really a point in living there anymore, even if some housing is kept forcibly affordable, because there's no longer a sense of a uh, home when anything that's new is clearly catering to the interests and incomes of future hypothetical higher income residents. The Baltimore Harbor is currently experiencing pressure of potentially speculative reinvestment, although this is a very nuanced conversation. Um, this topic involves systems of power and who is prioritized and who is listened to and who is considered worth helping or listening to. And that's where the heart of this thesis is, listening. So I'd like to ease us in with a little, just some quick snapshots of each neighborhood, nothing crazy. Um, so in Westport, this is Annapolis Road. It's the main road in the community. Um, there's a little, some commercial stuff, some residential on one side of the street. And in Curtis Bay, we're seeing Church Street. Um, this is one of the more residential streets. And if you go further down, there are churches, surprise. Um, if I said, you know, this is a neighborhood in Baltimore, you might be like, oh yeah, it makes sense. Like I can see it's neighborhoods. Um, it seems pretty typical. No. <laughs> if you turn around from each of those views, here's the other direction. Um, if you look the other way on Annapolis Road, you get a view of 95 and the incinerator and the smokestack that is somehow uh, something that people like to see as proud for as a source of pride for Baltimore. And then in Curtis Bay, if you turn around on Church Street, you see these warehouses and be further back of uh, piles of coal from the CSX terminal. So how can you feel valued if you know that those with authority, public or private, considered it to be okay for you and your neighbors to have to breathe in pollutants from an incinerator, breathe in coal dust, um, because it's been agreed upon that your community is just not as valuable as others? These are real neighborhoods with families, schools, churches, parks, and community organizations. From above, we see that yes, there are residential street grids, primary and secondary streets and parks, but to help orient us a little more, I just wanna point out a couple other organizing elements here. In Westport, we have 95 running east to west here. We have 295, which splits the neighborhood in half. Actually, there's a pedestrian bridge that people have to cross um, running north and south. And on the other side, you can see the water, the edge of the water, the uh, middle branch of the Patapsco. And in Curtis Bay on the right, we see, yeah, the one edge of the community is a park. And on the other side, there's these huge warehouses and a CSX terminal and a bunch of just other industrial uses. So to help ground us into where we'll be getting with all of this, um, here are the six aforementioned interventions that we'll be getting into. A historic baseball field, a waterfront network, a food co-op, a rec hall, a civic space and a dance hall. They're organized into three categories for the sake of this presentation. The anchors, the projections of change and the historical reconnections. So we reach these interventions by pulling on threads from some of the history, social media posts, um, present day community meetings, conversations, et cetera, and allowing those commonalities, those patterns of need to emerge. And from those patterns, a set of um, spatial responses of forms and strategies can be brought in to serve those needs in different ways. So the spatial forms and strategies that emerged here are the following. Modules representing simple flexibility and scalability. A pavilion representing outdoor gatherings and a sense of shelter while you're outside. Funneling as a source, as a strategy of moving people towards or towards something or through something. Um, blocking and buffering, uh, representing cushions between occupied areas and more industrial uses nearby. A great hall representing uh, an open welcoming space that can provide different degrees of enclosure. And a bridge representing a bridge. I mean, pedestrian connection. <laughs> Um, so if you're looking at these boards, this is for those online, if you're looking at the boards, you can see some of these forms emerging throughout the perspectives and keep in mind that these forms and strategies are re representing particular spatial needs that appeared. So let's work through these interventions, starting with the anchors. In Westport, the community organization leaders are socially ingrained within their neighborhoods and they're more than willing to advocate for residents' needs through politics and activism. 
As a formerly redlined neighborhood, Westport is experiencing food apartheid. The term food desert is not quite appropriate of a description as it doesn't reflect that this is happening as a result of decision making, not a geographic climate. Westport community leaders have mentioned in meetings that they are interested in acquiring the property currently occupied by a liquor and convenience store and turning that site into a food co-op and eatery. Since an operation like this might change in scope and um, scale over time, the, that module form allows the program to start small and flexibly. Architectural design inspiration can be, find, can be found simply across the street um, at the historic Westport Bank, and the neighborhood's history of glass making provides an opportunity for stained glass windows and skylights to, be, uh, to bring light into the spaces. And the importance of a place to celebrate community and food in the light of historic context here is not lost on residents, so this certainly qualifies as an anchor. In Curtis Bay, the community has placed a formal request to the city for a new recreation center. And while the community has had um, an architecture firm perform a feasibility study, the bureaucratic process of it all has hit enough roadblocks that it's a little unclear as to when this might come to fruition. The existing rec center today is the same rec center that was the first one of its kind in the 1950s in this neighborhood. So maybe at that time, maybe a singular building tucked away from the uh, primary street made the most sense at first, um, but the city's feasibility study proposed an equally tucked away building. Um, but I do wanna point out that several Curtis Bay meetings over the past year have had residents asking when this street, Pennington Ave, you see the building is on that side, when this street is going to become the main street and when it's gonna have more activity on it. I think this is something worth listening to. This thesis proposes a sort of deconstruction and dispersal of the community and recreation functions in a way that's more open and flexible and allows the community members to sort of claim more space within their community. A welcome hall right up by the street edge can bring people in, but across Curtis Ave, the next street over, um, there's a huge warehouse that is rumored to have been built for Amazon to move in, but they decided not to. This thesis sees that as an opportunity for this dispersal of programs. So one quote rec center uh, building doesn't have the pressure of needing to provide so many formal spaces all in one. Footpaths can funnel residents between the welcome hall and programmed warehouse spaces for workshops, classrooms, indoor sports, community health services, and design inspiration for the welcome hall could come from the proportions and dimensions of the firehouse that's on the same block. You can see it on the side of the, the perspective. So those are the anchors. And now let's shift into the next intervention category, the projections of change. These are the more um, radical, dare I say, political projections of how spaces that exist right now could really be reimagined and reclaimed by the community. The Westport waterfront spans the entire length of the gridded neighborhood, but it's largely inaccessible. This formerly industrial site is now envisioned for denser mixed use development by many. And there have been community meetings visited by architects and developers, and I don't wanna to get too into it, but the community has clarified that they would prefer for their needs and priorities to be met before a whole new population of people with their own interests and needs move in. One formal plan that the city has adopted, the Middle Branch Master Plan, proposed um, trail connections along the edge of the waterfront. And I think it's fair to hypothesize that it's hugging that edge partially because the development intentions might occupy the rest of that land. This thesis proposes an act of place taking, that the waterfront land remain largely untouched except for pedestrian bridges, trail connections that use the space, and some spaces for perhaps community programming like event spaces and office spaces for those community organizations. This neighborhood has been less than a quarter mile from the water for its entire existence. Now that the industrial uses are gone, residents should be able to connect to the water that's in their own neighborhood. The Middle Branch Trail System and Gwynns Falls Trails could connect in this network and a historic swing bridge that's no longer in use could provide additional pedestrian access across the water to Port Covington. And there could be these gateways bringing people into Westport and Westport residents could sort of use that as an opportunity to highlight where they would like to, like what, which places they would like to show off, where they would welcome visitors. The use for this waterfront property is not about maximizing development, but reconnection and placing community claim over the land. Now there's not really a great way of transitioning back over to the whole coal part of this, um, but here we are. 
So not only have Curtis Bay residents had to live in such close proximity to open air stored coal, but in 2021, there was actually an explosion here. As you might imagine, that's pretty bad. Um, if this happened and left layers of coal dust on your property and um, broke your windows, if it struck fear in your children to the point that they're kind of scarred now, um, you might be upset that this could even happen. Curtis Bay residents and those from the surrounding communities um, have had several protests over the past um, couple years, including this past December when they had a no coal for Christmas protest against CSX. It started at the rec center site and they walked along the warehouse um, property and ended in the industrial area. Messages of invest in community and we won't be silent anymore were projected up onto the warehouses. Residents are willing to take over public space in order to take a stand about something they care about. With that said, the projection of change in Curtis Bay is what I'm calling Church Street Commons. Church Street has, like I said before, churches further down the street. Um, so it already has a sort of congregational thing going for it. The easternmost point of Church Street does end at this warehouse and this pile of coal. And um, this coal is the same coal when people are walking down the street that they're seeing, yes, that broke windows and that's what I'm breathing in. So with this intervention, I'm not necessarily trying to say, come here, come protest here, because the whole point of protest is to occupy space that wasn't necessarily designed for that. But people are already protesting here. This is proposing pushing down the gates of this property um, in, in the warehouses and in between the warehouses so that they, they become more public space and it can be taken over in new ways. A Latin market to serve the growing Latinx community here could occupy some indoor and outdoor space. Um, there could be more everyday ways of um, giving space to the public like workshops on air quality monitoring perhaps. A path funneling towards a small stage could allow for public performances, however that manifests. And should a protest make its way that here, like it has in the past, um, there's a perfectly framed view of the problem. So this is the projection of change. And lastly, let's move on to the historic reconnections. We have some very interesting pieces of history rooted in these neighborhoods. Westport, in addition to being home to baseball legend Al Kaline, was also home to multiple baseball fields on which the Baltimore Black Sox practiced and played. These are historic sites one of which Westport Park uh, was within um, what's now the formal boundaries of the community today. And, but what is this property now? It's a warehouse. Westport community leaders are well aware of this history. They have an archive of news articles from all across time of any time Westport has been mentioned. They know this about their neighborhood. It's unfortunate that some of the only publicly available evidence of these fields is a 1927 aerial photograph that happened to capture the fields before they were removed. During the course of this thesis, an RFP was released by the Parks and People Foundation for a consultant to, quote, lead the effort to honor the Baltimore Black Sox, unquote. Now, that would certainly be a whole thesis in itself if I chose to do that. Um, and that would involve an entire marketing and tourism campaign, absolutely. But this thesis proposes to restore the historic baseball field and provide basic park programming via a pavilion, a welcome hall slash maybe a small museum about the, the Black Sox and other small structures for concessions and restrooms. A path through the park would connect the Gwynns Falls Trail that I mentioned before to the waterfront network and trees planted north of the field would be a bit of a tree canopy buffer between the park and 95 and the incinerator, which are right there. So this is about resurfacing this piece of history that belongs to Westport and that has been buried. At the southernmost point of Curtis Bay, there is an industrially zoned lot currently, but it hasn't always been that way. In the late 19th and early 20th century, this lot housed Floods Park, which advertised itself as a beer garden, a dance hall, and a theater. Curtis Bay, the, Curtis Bay does not have this type of programming today post redlining. This thesis proposes bringing back some of that programming of public dance with a touch of environmental education at the, since it's right at the water. Um, a welcome hall brings visitors in at the entrance to the site and releases them into sort of a boardwalk loop that includes dance pavilions, an overlook to learn about the ship graveyard and view across the water, and an environmental outpost for education and maybe water quality monitoring. 
Curtis Bay currently has no access to this water at all. And they're so close to it as well. And we know this, this particular lot has not always been industrial, so it, it should be given back. So these have been <laughs> six interventions across two neighborhoods. These commonalities in the, the needs broadly, programmatically and spatially that, and these needs that emerge in this community informed approach um, allows the designer to start with empathy and learn the needs from the community members, the experts. And that is all, thank you. And I look forward to continuing this discussion with you now. I think, yeah, this is working. Thank you for the presentation. Really amazing work. Um, I have a lot of thoughts and questions, but I want to start with one kind of, I think, simple thing first, which is uh, talking about your that last slide you showed, and let's call it the master plan. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, because I listened to your whole presentation, and I was really drawn to the kind of, um, it, perhaps in opposition to the previous project, but there was a strong center, and then this idea that it could branch out and propagate. Uh, what I'm really intrigued um, about your project is the lack of a center, and this idea that you are uh, decentralizing the master plan. Do you need a master plan really would be my question. Or can you show this as a series of independent fragments and still get what you're trying to get to? It, I, I don't have an answer to that, but I'm very curious to your thought process about that. Does that um, make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, that is a great question. That's something that I have certainly gone like in circles thinking about is should there be something that I define as the center? Um, I didn't think that using the word like center really made sense. That's why I used the word anchors to define some of the more defined site specific things. Um, but I don't think it's for me to define the center in this case. Yeah, and so I think that's a great answer. And maybe one quick follow up to that would be, so I love how this project comes off as a kind of an architectural acupuncture as opposed to like top down this is what we're doing and we want to make a lot of money and hopefully it works this is very thoughtful very um <clears throat> aware of a multitude of layers uh in the local community not just about how the urban planning works but down to the history which i think is fantastic my um, provocation to all this is like, I love it. I wonder if there's a space or even if it's part of this conversation, it should be part of this conversation to rethink how we represent and we talk about a project like this, not trying to shoehorn it into a master plan, but give it a completely different um, delivery. So is it a movie? Like, Because it, 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 this is storytelling to me. And how do you convey it to your audience uh, and how do you use the conventions of architecture and disrupt the conventions of architecture to do that, to me, is part and parcel of what you're trying to do. Um, I personally, I think like a, a film could be a great way of delivering this project with your narrative and maybe also interviews and archival material from the community. Uh, I, I love it. And I'm trying to think how you can... Um, really own that sense of fragmentation to uh, beyond the, the uh, cliche of the architectural master plan. So uh, it's not really a question, but it kind of, I'm just trying to express my admiration for what you're doing and where you could go with it as a disciplinary problem. Hopefully it makes some sense. Yes, and thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I, I've... Um, I, I agree totally. I, I was, I've been listening to your presentation and the, I mean, your starting point is so compelling, right? Um, these, these uh, marginalized communities, these, these neighbor, these neighborhoods that have been kind of systemically disrupted um, 
and I was thinking that this isn't really like, it's not really a, a, a when you think about sort of creating a master plan in a, as an expansion of a city or in a, you know, a new development in a, in a field, it's a completely different, um, you know, kind of animal. And I was, I was thinking that your, your role in this almost seems to be less of a master planner than like advocate. Um, and, and I started, to, and I started thinking of the process. So in a community like this, where does the sort of planning or where does the, the impetus for change happen? And if it's happening, I feel like it's more happening at the kind of a grassroots community um, organization kind of level. And I don't, you know, I feel like if starting from there, you might, and working with communities, you might have very different programmatic outcomes um, than maybe some of the things that you're even envisioning here, even though you're sort of thinking opportunistically, but it's still coming from maybe a, a little bit more of an outside perspective. And I started wondering if this couldn't, if the project isn't really more about creating like a framework, a blue, like a, a roadmap for communities to, because you've, you've identified two communities, but there's like, there could be like a hundred communities just like this. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a group in New York that we work with occasionally called the, I think it's called the Roush Foundation. Um, one, what, the project that actually launched my company and career was a little waterfront park in the village of Greenport. And the mayor there was, you know, the advocate. And he went on to become, you know, later in his you know life, serves on the board of the Roush Foundation that occasionally ropes us in to do pro bono work for communities and creating proposals and things. And I was just thinking that maybe like that's, I feel like that's where this project enters more in. Like how would you, how would you maybe, there's gotta be uh, communities that are success stories around the country that you could start to like connect and start to say, how did you do this? What's the blueprint? And, and you know, and then you could take that as almost a tool to these, communities and start letting them use that tool um, to to kind of form their own like what they how how they would want to see the intervention and how do you finance that do you get grants I mean there's a whole there's a whole process for doing this mm -hmm. but I feel like I feel like that's more where this project wants to sit than architectural proposals somehow but I don't know maybe no one maybe there's other points of view <laughs> I think we have some point of view down on our there. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, organizations that do work like that is sort of where I started with my, my they, those were my my precedents. It didn't actually start with architectural stuff at first. It was only later on that the architecture precedents came into view once the information felt like it was there. I love this project. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like you're missing one board on a wall, right? And that what I really focused in on a presentation that you gave was this idea of creating a anchor, a projection of change, and a historic reconnection. And I think that's your roadmap. And what you're really saying is before any other development can happen in these communities, someone needs to go in, they need to work with the community, they need to provide them an anchor, which I took from your presentation as being the place that meets the community kind of service need for them, right? Be it a rec center or, you know, some other type of civic or service related amenity. And then the reconnect um, projections of change, which I took as preserving a portion of that area for the existing community before somebody else can come in and take it over to do what they want to do that's new. And then the historic reconnections, which says, let's honor the history of what was here and re-emphasize that as maybe a, a impetus for the development of the community. So it's almost like your project is what needed to happen before the previous project that we, we saw happen, right? And that gives you the full balance of what it is. So I 100% I agree with the um, comment that you've started to hit on something really great here. And what, what I want to see is the formalization of your roadmap that says, okay, communities, let's start with this to heal the trauma of your past. And then we can talk about the development of the future. 
I think that's a great idea. I, I definitely, I, if I had worked those concepts into the broad organization of this, I think it could um, bring a different element to it. Building on that a little bit, and I'm kind of, it, it's just beautiful sitting here with this light and kind of the whole, <laughs> the whole thing is really um, a beautiful story. So thank you um, for that. I, I think there's um, a regenerative development framework here that you're, you're threading, um, which is um, beautiful because it is, you know, you didn't have the benefit of like talking to communities. You're not actually engaging a bunch of stakeholders, I assume. Um, so I have one question about that, but I wanted to just kind of um, reflect that, like whether it was intentional or just sort of intuitive to your like view of what planners are and how planning should um, happen, um, you know, redressing past um, damage, right? And I think there's like layers of like physical, social, financial um, capital that's been eroded here. And you're trying to um, start from a regenerative point and uh, rebuild those, right? And that's, there's a whole world of regenerative development I think you should um, look into if you if you haven't already, because you're you're definitely coming from that um, line of thinking, that school of thought. A lot of those folks actually are in Baltimore too. Um, so you should look up the Knott family um, in Baltimore and their uh, master craftsmen, they call themselves servant builders. But anyway, um, you're like onto something amazing. My question is, where did you get stuck? Because you didn't have the the kind of um, ability to interact with a bunch of you know community and do com truly community generated ideas. Um, and I think you make a great point. It probably would have turned out different and you're very open to that. I can hear that. Um, where did you get stuck? I'm just curious, like, you know, God, I wish I could like talk to people about what they actually want and the discomfort yeah. you might've had about projecting something that um, you think is, you know, in service of a community, but you didn't have that um, kind of input. Yes, um, that is how it feels. And I basically got stuck there when transitioning from having like all of the research and like spending time checking social media every day to see what's going on today with the communities transitioning to, okay, now it's time to design and knowing that these communities are like kind of being roped into engagement sessions, like real ones. And so to get roped into one with a student where she can't promise anything, um, it's sort of, I, I just knew that I can't really uh, insert myself there. Um, so the confidence of feeling ready to start doing any making design design decisions uh, was a little overwhelming at first. Thanks. Um, first of all, I want to say that you you have a great gift, which is your verbal presentation was really outstanding. Thank you. And and that I think is seriously undervalued in architecture schools because out in the real world, you're talking to real people about real things, and they do not want to hear architect speak um but I, I thought your verbal presentation was very compelling i do think it was more compelling than the than the graphic presentation and you know my first question in my head but i think everybody else kind of answered it for me is why do two of these you know um and you you started out talking about that but to me, in the end, it doesn't really matter because you could you could label you could take the labels off this and and look at so many neighborhoods around the country, but certainly around Baltimore, and and use this technique. So I think it's really a process presentation that you're making more than an architectural presentation. So, but at the level of architecture, well, let's talk about the level of process for a second, which is. I think you know you're you're getting at a whole lot of very very serious issues. Uh, you know, redlining. I think that the private ownership of waterfronts is, you know, in a lot of ways, absolutely awful. Um, and you know, if you're in the, these neighborhoods, you're really on an island separated from the water. It's like you live on an island, but you can't get to the water. And and the water is then surrounded by chain link fences and big signs that say "keep out of here." And you know how does that feel? I mean that is a that is a terrible um, and particularly in Baltimore where the water is so integral to the history, but also integral to getting out of these neighborhoods and into other parts of Baltimore. 
So I, I certainly agree with the film idea. I think that's, that's really good. I mean, I would think that a project like this would really start with a kit of parts um, and maybe, you know, maybe it's as simple as signs or markers or something about history. And you do sort of a scenographic presentation of that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, co- connecting neighborhoods back to their own history, I think is, you know, something that, that we do. And, and it's really fascinating. I love the part about the glass making. I, I just thought, you know, you, you could use that sort of tool, you know, as you make these yeah. wonderful kind of glass objects or something, you know, I don't know, I can't yeah. tell you what it is, but um, so I would, I would look to um, the scenographic sort of potential of this, uh, you know, you, you've, you've chosen a really hard problem and uh, but you know, it's pretty cool. I like it. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. So I want to echo the point about the, the verbal presentation. I actually am really compelled by the graphics too. There's something about, you know, I, certainly there's resolution issues with the architecture and things that I don't think you got to because you had six interventions and you had these big ideas um, but but yeah, the, the 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 fact that it was remarked to make a film or you know that that there's a narrative, you you absolutely were telling this story that felt like it pulled us in. Um, and that is super powerful. I think the thing that's that I love about it the most is is actually these bottom two things that I was thinking about how often you get shown like a word cloud, you know, and it has like these words that pull out and everybody looks at it and you say, cool. And then it's like, what, well, what, what, like, what do you mean? What does this have to do with anything? So that you did this, like, this is really like this idea. And I, I'm sure that you did a lot more. I, I actually wish you had another board that was like all of this, this kind of research, like graphics, like huge, because to me, the f- and, and I would actually push back a little bit on the, I, I get what you're saying about this, the kind of signage and stuff, but I, I don't think it's a kid of parts thing at all. I think it's, Taylor made decisions about it's listening, like you said, and it's very interesting to me that you kind of were, you were kind of self, you know, you kind of said something about your self-confidence. And I think what I, what I've got out of this is that you should be very confident in your restraint and your willingness to listen and your, and then your ability to synthesize, synthesize that and then tell somebody what you heard in a way that's not pushy or rude or you know you you listened and I think I think you would be a major asset in in those kinds of conversations and the fact that you even had the restraint to say like I couldn't insert myself in that because these people are already dealing with these issues constantly and being asked to come to town halls and being asked to come you know like who am I to do, to say that? So I think what you said is that you're like, I, I get that if you had been put in that situ- situation for real, that you would have gotten to a really great answer. And I think that's, that is a skill for sure. Thank you. I actually think you already have your kid of parts, but it's not what we would traditionally think of as a kid of parts, right? It's not about physical form and structures. It's about a kit of interventions that need to be talked about and addressed in a way that directly um, impacts the community needs or responds to the community needs in order to then proceed to designing the architecture that's appropriate for the community you're serving. Yeah, I think it's, I think you're right. It's like, like you said, it's a process thing and that, um, you know, this idea of, that it's not even a master plan. It's like the, it's the precursor to master plan. It, it needs its own cool name, you know, whether it's regenerative development or whatever. It's like, what do you have to do to, to, to kind of the antithesis of, of um, gentrification? Like how do you do something first that says you are welcome here before we do anything else? Great presentation. I re- really enjoyed it. And I, I think, you really astutely uh, highlighted kind of a, a f- uh, kind of a, a relationship where you know we as a society we value this thin strip of real estate along the water like that entire boundary of the harbor is so valuable to society and so expensive and but then you you move outside of that and 
those communities are so devalued and that kind of immediate factor being next to each other is so jarring. And, um, and it's a really interesting um, way to kind of illustrate that. And, uh, you know, I think in broad strokes, what, what, you're, what you're doing here is kind of looking at these communities, studying their needs and, and really reaching out to this valuable kind of asset, the water. And, and I, I could see in these diagrams, like kind of the yellow is shifting and connecting the communities to, you know, this prized asset. Um, I think what, to kind of take that even further, I, I think there is value and having done a, a couple waterfront um, projects, having a physical presence for these communities on the water to, as a sign, as, it, as an anchor is kind of important because, uh, you know, if, if it's just, yeah, if it's open and void, future generations will, you know, the CX, CSX terminal will grow and they'll want to take over Curtis Point and kind of, and unless there's a physical anchor, something, you know, Curtis Bay saying, hey, here's our flag, we're going to be on the water, we're always going to be here. Um, and we're intimately connected to this, that kind of fills the, fills the void and, and really says something to society that, you know, we, we are here, we're part of the waterfront and we're not going away. And I think that, you know, if I was to take this to the next level, I would kind of study kind of the water line, study the community needs and really kind of put, put something physical and, and immediate and visceral out there for the communities. Thank you for that. Actually, is there time to add one more thing? Yeah. yeah. So I I'm um uh kind of want to go back for a second to the discussion about the kid of parts versus a high precise specificity. Well, I think you're doing both. Yeah. And I I feel that there is an enormous amount of potential there also for talking about like going back to how you stage and deliver this project to me is is a methodology. Like it's it's rethinking how we work as architects as far as I know but also potentially as urban planners. Uh, and I think you you could definitely delve a little bit deeper. It could be the representation, it could be the delivery, but it, into the the rigor of how this is done, which I think you talked about extremely eloquent, has been pointed out a number of times. Uh, the next part that I would be really interested in, uh, and this is totally not a criticism, is like material for future development. I always see these as not as an end, but as the beginning of a, of a process for you guys. Um, that who am I to make those decisions kind of question, it, I think is very profound and very valid. Um, it, if at some point, I don't know how much you've been able to do that, but you really start to flesh out each and every one of these anchors to like, like what to the nitty gritty, like what is it? And like, how do we go about making decisions about uh, its program, its uh contextual relationship to what's on it, so on and so forth. Uh, I guess I'd be really curious to know if you had time to think about that and how you would approach it. I certainly did uh, get a little bit into the process of uh, deciding certain materialities, certain um, little details and stuff that I felt, you know, I could start to explain those as well. I think the broader story was the most important thing to get across, but Yes, I think I think that these sort of ideas can filter down to that small level of detail, and I think it should. And maybe just like one very last comment, um, if there is a space here for starting to think seriously about co-designing mm -hmm. this with the community, not just theoretically, but actually in practice. So what the architect does is set a process in motion rather than say, here's a building. And then begin to, I mean, I, the immediate person that comes to mind is Cedric Price. I don't even, I don't know if you ever looked at his work. I'm not sure. Yeah. But anyway, I think it's something worth considering. Like, how do you approach the, the object problem in this project as an architect, where not only you as a designer and your team, but the whole community is part of what ends up being like physically there at the end of the process. Uh, again, not a criticism. I think this is, it's fascinating that you were able to get this far and generate this amazing conversation. So kudos to you. And Thank congratulations. you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. My name is Ariel Bierbaum. I'm on the faculty of the Urban Studies and Planning Program and was uh, Danielle's planning faculty rep on her committee. Um, I just want to thank everyone for their comments. Danielle, I'm um, so proud of what you, you created and this conversation. Um, I think is so compelling because it provided really a more robust vocabulary to all of the tensions 
that we talked about month over month um, in the process and the ways that you all um, challenged and raised and engaged um, with that tension between how we have a process of integrity with high excellent design quality um, and that those things sometimes rub up against each other. And that was what I think Danielle through her whole career as a dual degree um, has challenged herself with. And so it's no surprise that her thesis, thesis project would sort of be the culmination of sitting in that tension as she carries on with her work. So um, I just want to thank all of you because I have all sorts of ideas of where Danielle could go, but also the next the next thesis committee that I sit on, because um, I think it was really a, a generative conversation. Um, and uh, I just want to also particularly say the comment about the having a last board with those things, I would fully in, endorse that. Um, so I think, again, the level of uh, research and listening, despite her distance that Danielle did, um, far exceeded what we often see um, on these kinds of thesis projects. Um, and as the faculty that teaches qualitative research methods to planners, I was particularly pleased with that. So I think figuring out how we um, make that really visible, um, that backstory visible on these boards is, is another sort of disciplinary challenge as we move forward. But great job and thank you all again to the, to the respondents. Oh, one more, sorry, <laughs> I'll be brief. Um, very proud of you. Uh, I always found you to be a very thoughtful and empathetic person, and I think it, I think it really came through in your work. Um, and that was our goal from day one. And uh, I think, you know, we we talked a lot about actually making a pattern book, like you said. And we looked at pattern language a lot. Um, so maybe that's the next step. So congrats. Thank you. Congratulations. And we'll be rotating. 90 degrees one last time for the morning for our last presentation before lunch. Like development
this should be there and, and the, the strain should be here. Move this. Let's put the screen from this corner over. Pull up that corner. Uh, yeah. You sure you got enough space there, man? Oh, look a little bit further out. I feel like you're going to be crushed there. Yeah. Okay, we're getting organized here for our last presentation of the morning. So if you're on the jury, feel free to gather and find your seat. And if you're a student or a visitor, you're welcome to sit up front too. We have row two and row three, row four, nice and open, VIP seats. No, but you can sit close if you want to. Committee can sit close. Alumni can sit close. There we go. That's that's nice. Yeah, that's nice. We're all here together in person. Thanks. You want to go back to the? Is this the first slide? This is this. Uh, yeah, can go. This is the first slide. This is. <laughs> I'm good, thank you very much. Okay, we are going to start our final presentation. And after that, um, jury and faculty will head upstairs and then we'll come back at two. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, so whoever told me that I'll get better at public speak after 30 is mistaken. I'm sorry. Uh, but today is my final day at uh, UMD. So I'm really glad to be here and through that journey. I've met great people, great mentors, great professors that really helped me through. And I don't think I would be uh, better without them. So thanks to everyone and helped me through this journey. And I will start with my thesis. Uh, so my thesis is started with the question is, can we improve the, uh, the like what, what abandoned, abandoned industrial side uh, can how can how can they do better and how can we um, promote for these places to uh, for better master planning in terms of uh, this this th this site has like a prime location through uh, front of waterfronts that most of the cases uh, they disconnected uh, uh, the city from its waterfront uh, and especially. Uh, promoting the idea can we create a new place in this abandoned industrial site where people where we can keep the uh, uh, industrial light light industrial elements into it and create new place where people can live supply sell produce work and have that sort of neighborhood connectivity and um, community attraction where people can really live in that neighborhood 
without without the fear of these abandoned industrial sites and their uh, limitation that really create for its surrounding. And when we talked about abandoned industrial site, most of you, or like at least for a lot of you, think of brownfield sites. And uh, brownfield sites are the uh, most on most of the time they're uh, they're the synonym for the for the uh, industrial abandoned industrial sites where they they're they're located in many major cities by uh, and they have prime locations uh, close to highways, transportation and waterfronts. Uh, but no, normally they really um, create that disconnection. This connection where we can see it in major American cities in San Francisco and uh, in DC in the Southeast in Iowa. Um, it's, is that how we want, we all want to, to our city to uh, connect to the river? Is that how uh, river or how waterfronts are important to people? And then we moved, I moved to, through uh, the location. Uh, I, I love DC and since I moved to here, I, I moved to DC and I feel special at, at like, uh, attachment to DC. So one of the reasons I wanted to do something in DC, secondly, it's something has to uh, have relationship with my uh, real estate development program. So we start looking at sites in DC that meet the criteria of abandoned industrial zoning, and they have a location at the waterfront. Uh, we found that site at the Southeast uh, DC, where there is couple there, uh, and we decided to investigate that and this neighborhood and this area. And when we start to talking about industrial and what kind of job it offers and why we're doing this, we have to understand what type of jobs is pranking into the table. And inter inter interestingly, it is about 6% of the overall uh, DC uh, employment uh, where it, it is with the one mile radius of this neighborhood which can be a potential for a lot of work uh, and uh, employment for low income people where they, education might not be a big part of it. Like my, uh, where people with high, maybe lower than high school degree can work in these facilities and create that neighborhood. Uh, studying that further, understanding demographics and demands, we have to understand them uh, and we have, so we know what, what, what type of people, what type of improvement, what type uh, of neighborhood we're bringing to the city. We understand with the, the uh, demographic, we understand that this area has about 319,000 per square footage per uh, person per square footage uh, around DC. And it, the rental, the rental uh, units uh, ratio is 53%, which pretty much, similar to, or a little bit lower than the one in uh, the, the average rent, the average rental percentage in DC. Uh, this diagram here, uh, as sketchy and dummy as it might look, uh, it tells us story and tells us what type of population, what we're trying to target. Um, it tells us here, from the big picture, when we're looking at it, that the medium income of DC, if the average uh, household in DC is 90K. But if we just zoomed in without really dig into the details, we can see that the medium income for the one mile radius of this Southeast area, it is about 97K, which is above the DC uh, medium income. But is that true? Like, doesn't make sense whenever I start presenting that. So we decided to go deep inside the tract number and understand what, um, wh why is that? And what we found out that north the side, there is the Capitol Hill neighborhood, the Navy Yard with the medium income of over 150K per person. But if we looked at the south of the side where Anacostia uh, Park is, the medium income of the the household is about 40k per person which is like it feels like the side is creating that wall between high income and low income and start to raising more questions how can we uh, bridge the gap between that wall and between that uh, 
a difference between both the income and uh, total number of units owned versus uh, rented. But also we have to study uh, the, uh, uh, the, the forecast for both household and for employment rate. And for the next 10 years, we can see there is a huge uh, like potential improvement on both rates, which really uh, emphasize the idea of potential uh, placemaking where people can live and work in this neighborhood is possible based on what uh, the, the forecast of both the employment rate and the household. Uh, zooming into the history of the site itself uh, and really try to understand when is the click or when is the change start happening. We can see that in the first planning, a uh, plan in DC at the 1791 uh, Le Fem plan, Maso plan, this, this site has really integrated very well and nicely with the uh, um, uh, with the city grid and it also but it started to make that shift and make that uh wedge shape after the federal eight highway act uh when it started constructing in the 1973 uh and started to shape the the side as it it is today and so two facts we understand right now the site is abandoned and really the, the way it is right now, it's not only because it's an industrial and there was an economical denial, uh, but it also the Highway Act helps into uh, disconnecting the site to the waterfront. Uh, here a picture from Google Earth from three different time, uh, how it started from industrial after the um, the, the, structure, uh, the structure of the highways, how it started to shape and then what does it look like today? Um, this is a fu very fun exercise. I did a bunch of the, them, but I uh, this is the one that I included here. Uh, this, this is a scale over uh, lay of what is the site might look like uh, if we kept the, the, the Le Fond plan, Messel plan, and what we're missing through this highways and through um, the, the, the industrial sites. We can see that the shoreline significantly it changed. There was there was more interaction with the city grid. There was like that port notch where people where there is like most pro probably tr it's promote for trade and people to interact with the waterfront more. There was a park over the southeast boulevard that get right now uh, missed. And of course, not ignoring the fact that DC blocks get larger over time. So uh, going more into the site itself, we zoom in and we decided to take that side further, uh, but also looking at the future uh, transportation uh, and a coastal waterfront in innovative where we also in the thesis, we, we the most important thing we wanted is to whatever the thesis outcome, it should really talks to what is the planning uh, and what is the city has planning. One, one of the important projects that we have to note is the Barney Circle Southeast Boulevard, which I placed it as a placeholder, as a, if something is coming to the area because it is, uh, it's, it, it's right now something happening. 11th Street Bridge and the extension of the water taxi, uh, where there is a potential, since there is a plan to extend the water taxi program in DC, there will be a, like potential hopefully to connect this um, side with the south area by water taxi, making that water connection more. Uh, the site has very nice features. Uh, uh, including the, the 11th Street Park new development that is still in construction, uh, the river walk by, uh, by the Anacostia River, but it also has a weird connection like the Southeast Boulevard that is really um, creating that boundary with the site itself and the CSX rail too. Um, we can see that also the site analysis um, for the zoning, uh, there is not much uh, density in terms of what people can build. It's only PDR. Um, 
which we are trying to build onto that, keep the PDR, P, the production and uh, function into it, but we want to build more uh, mixed use development into that. Um, the block diagrams, we can see that how is there, how the city grid really exactly disconnecting while it reached the boundary of the site. Uh, building density, uh, we can see how is that site itself has very low building density in comparison to the surroundings. Uh, and um, we can see that also the flood diagrams here, the existing flood diagrams shows that there, there is no huge flood uh, hazard. It's only around the edges, but we have also to keep in consideration how to address that and prevent it from any hazard that ha can happen to the pre future developments. Uh, looking into the site itself in sectional way, we can see that the uh, most important thing is that there is a retaining wall that is 14 feet six inch uh, diff uh, that's splitting the side from the Capitol Hill neighborhood. And the overall slab between the levels change is 50 feet, uh, which we have to build into it. The slope changes and go lower when we uh, walk to the east more. Now, moving to the vision itself, uh, I, I want to reemphasize about the, the programming of the site and what we're trying to do. We're trying to build that circle of programs that has uh, living and retail and uh, affordable units and flexible spaces and factories, maybe small light. When I say factories, it's light industrial, like uh, work workshops or uh, uh, or, or small industrial uh, buildings and create that circle of live, work, produce, and sell. Uh, this is the existing site plan uh, in details. And this is the proposed site plan. This proposed site plan has, uh, I'll go back and forth between them so we can understand them more. Uh, so when M Street coming to the site and the existing drawings, it uh, it goes straight into a circle and then it end up to the trail a trail, but here in this development we bend it about eight percent to offer more uh, uh, face building to the um, uh, to the blocks, and uh, we want to, the connection to be through a marketplace or to uh, like an aha moment that make that transition between the M street and the uh, uh, trail, the waterfront trail. And also uh, here we can see that, how is that happening uh, with only the block diagrams? And the, the blue the dashed line is the indicator of where uh, the existing shoreline is. And how is the existing um, or how is the proposed uh, master plan is promoting to change that in a way that to help the city to integrate more with the uh, with the river instead of uh, the entire thing is to bring water inside and make that connection higher and bring that water in, inside the development too. Uh, in terms of building density, as you remember in previous slides, there was almost no building density. Um, the building density talks more into the size and dimensions to the Navy Yard, since it's a mixed use development proposal. Um, this is the crossroads to the, uh, to, uh, to the north, east, north and south connection uh, and place diagrams where we can see that there is like a couple potential places that can be created along the water and uh, all this all the blocks have like a direct re relationship to the waterfront right now. Um, th this diagram shows how the, the idea of connecting the Anacostia Park um, really can work with the water taxi idea and bring more people and accessibility, ma make the site more accessible from south to north. Um, the red line here is showing how is the riverfront trail is connected to the 11th Street Bridge Park, 
which is also another node of connection connection for pedestrian it might be for uh, vehicles too and it's all accessible to the site itself oh uh, this section here uh this is the existing condition section we can see that there is a lot of going on on the topography and shows that it, it's a abandoned site so what we're expecting <laughs> um but in uh in the proposed one we are building up into uh the south the southeast boulevard uh, development but we are also making the csx trail going um under a, can a tunnel where it is leveling up with the uh, southeast boulevard development that has been done by smith group and connecting the two neighborhood by um stairs and ramps um and, can, and that can be one notes too and the other notes or the another connection from the 14th street going down to m street it will be through a marketplace neighborhood which we all can see in this rendering here it is a connection where there is two main stair system and elevator where it's eye catching by purpose to basically uh, create the uh, destination or a landmark for people to come into the site and invite them more. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a 3D diagram explaining how is that connection can work on, th on 3D both. Uh, with the um, with two, one main uh, street connection, which can be accessed by core, and two pedestrian connection to the uh, north of the Capitol Hill, which bringing Capitol Hill neighborhood all to the water. And um, by my five minutes walk right now, you can reach out from the site to the Capitol Hill neighborhood, uh, which it wasn't the way before these two connections. Uh, the uses promote a lot, a lot of mixed uses, including uh, the major thing is uh, residential. But there is a, and inside each block there is uh, that, that that diversity. Each block has diversity of retail, industrial, and residential um, uh, units and uh, or buildings into them. Uh, there is also two main civic buildings, which are the kayaking center that we will talk more about it um and the marketplace in addition to a stormwater management facility at the highest point of the site itself um and the system really for the canal and for sustainability is going through it, it, it's it's going to collect the runoff uh water and um go from all the buildings and from the the, the streets for, for, um and also from the canal system and make it as a way to regenerate water to the buildings around it and to the entire development. And for each block, there will be its own system that is going through uh, cistern and filter and then uh, main uh, water management um, blocks. A close up uh, master plan, um, we can see that there there is that uh, there was an extension for the bike line in m street to the to to walk more into the site itself and to make it the 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 main street that has a promenade to that connect you to the waterfront and to the uh trail too uh there is uh four no or three four notes for this uh, development uh that are worth exploring and I think I, I'd rather explore, explore them here by walking. Uh, so the notes are all located on M Street. And the way that I, I swear I did not love doing six posters, but <laughs> I, I, I thought it's necessary. It's, it's, it's like give you a walk in M Street and highlights only the notes that you can see from that walk. And this can include a public space where people can gather and uh, create more interaction to each other because it's a high, like mixed diversity um, and nothing better than Spanish steps and with ramps that can be <laughs> connect people together. Marketplace and kayaking and rowing center, 
the, I know that kayaking and rowing is a big cultural thing in DC. And um, there is a bunch of yacht clubs in this area. So I do want it to have that connection uh, and make sure that the, the, the culture of rowing and kayaking has is explored more in this side. Since we took the walk on M Street together there, I don't think I need to go through these slides. Um, I do want to move to the kayaking center and rowing club, which also uh, the idea of this thesis is bringing people together and like also study a building where it has a three or, or multiple function at the same time. Um, this, this center has three main uh, buildings that are, are all attached to each other. The th number three is the, the boathouse where you can you, we, where you can have an access uh, where you can have a direct access to the water. Um, number one is uh, th there is a retail and there is a gym with the community center component. And number two is where is the workshop can be happened in this uh, building itself. Um, the, um, the, the, the workshop has two main rooms or main uh, manufacturing areas where it's suitable for multiple size of row, rowing house. That circles here is just to make sure that the, ac the, the, the accessibility of the largest boats, which is for eight people, can go through the site itself and get in and out. So it's more of, th that's why the spacing is very important in this building. Um, and then you can get the, from the boathouse, you can go uh, get your rowing uh, boats and start rowing. Uh, it's a three-story, number one building is a three-story buildings where the second floor is a rowing, there will be a rowing center with the, the circulation, rowing clubs. And the third floor is a gym, locker room, and a, a small community room. Um, we can see in section um, that how is the site is connect, uh, how, how is spacing between the buildings and um, the, the idea is to have this building uh, as a CLT. And the, 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 that's one of the reason is it is a little bit raised up to the floor just to protect it also to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to protect it from any uh, over floating in the future, which uh, hopefully it's not going to happen until five, five, 500 years. And it's, it's kind of created that uh, um, center of attention where you can see that the center of attention where you, the main main boats here is really the place where make the center and the most essential connection to the river itself so you can get into and out from that um, and with that i would like to uh, uh, conclude that i loved working with this project i tried to do my best to assess with the um, connectivity problems that the sites suffer, the diversity problem, and the uh, community uh, in terms of making this is a place more than anything else where people can enjoy and live together uh, in um, mixed used mixed income neighborhood. It's and that's thank you very much, and I, I'm looking forward to your questions. Hello. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Um, just a couple of clarifying questions, and then maybe everyone will get warmed up to ask better questions than I. Um, you had a diagram of vehicular access, the blue dotted vehicular access. Could you go back to that and just explain to us your thinking on pulling vehicles through the site? Yeah. yeah. So this is the M Street connection. And just make sure that there will not, uh, due to the challenges with the topography between the no north and south, uh, 
There will be only a connection through a pedestrian connection, but this connection already existed, but we emphasize it more into the main side. Okay, so that blue is, is already the, a road. Yeah. That exists. This, the, the, it, it exists, but we bended it. Like we make, uh -huh. we, we improve it. It's a road. It's a road. Okay. Yes, it does. It does goes. I can, it, there is, this, the M Street goes in under the bridge. Uh, it is here. So it goes under. Um, sorry, could you explain the sections at the nodes I'm having? So I know there's a, so there's a plan down here that has section cuts, but I was just having a really tough time kind of line, lining myself up on these where, sections. Well, where they're happening, because I'm looking at this. Okay. So this one, I can tell which one that is because of the houses. Um, so you know, when I look at, when I look at this axonometric here, I'm trying to understand where these are happening. And that one is this, this is one because of the. But this, yeah, so this one here, I'm trying to understand there's a slip and it, I don't know if this is just foreshortened because this looks like I'm looking at- This one here. Yeah, it looks very different there. It looks very different in the axon than it does here. So where am I? You are looking from here up there. So- But this is the slip that's in the foreground, isn't it? Well, there's like a tunnel, I guess you go- There is a tunnel street, that coming inside here. Street, yes, there is a canal system here. Correct. You're cutting through a cut, the canal. So, up okay. The, I so yeah. that's a it's section like your cut. Section cut from so the street. It's like the you know it looks like this front end. So yeah, sorry. It's so, all section cut God, from here cut. and from here too. Looking up. This one, yes, that is the the connection. So both sections on the top, they're the main sections are from here and here. So they're the two connection from 13 and 14 street. That's where these two section cuts are made. Okay, so where's the longitudinal section there that goes through? This is AA from right, here. But, so so where, where is BB? Like where, but where is like this? Because you're saying there there's, I don't, I don't see the bridge in that section. Where's that happening? Well, the, this is here where the canal get in sight. Okay. okay. All right. It's just yeah, I think um well I, I think I think um you know like like from where you started with the brownfield sites and wanting to reconnect communities and um provide access to waterfronts and thinking about the community that's here. Um I think you have a lot. You're there's a lot. There's a there's a lot that you've tackled. Um, I think you're. I think there's there's a little bit of a lack of clarity, I guess, for me in in trying to understand how you got from, uh, from those kind of like really compelling concerns and the brownfield reclamation to, um, you know, to where you landed with the proposal. Um, did you have? Was there? Did you did you really study the community? here and and was, i mean i'm assuming there's been i'm assuming there's some information out there about uh you know about like sort of what this community would would want and need um in their waterfront yeah one of the main needs uh, stuff that they were like is the rowing and kayaking culture into it and is that there well okay it, it, for real Yes, it is big things. Like it is <laughs> okay. when I started doing this project. Whenever I, as somebody will, I will hear me that working on this side, they'll tell you, they'll always tell me, well, we kayak along this side. I went through this side through, and I I, I saw that. So there is, uh, it is a culture, and it's something that try I'm trying to emphasize there. So too. the the residents in this neighborhood who are earning the $40,000 a year into, no, that's what no, they that's okay. it's the $150,000 yeah. a year neighborhood and the $40,000 a year people live on the other side of the river. But, but at the same time, not entirely. It seems like that's the way the breakout is coming through though and the way this is. So let me, let me back up. When I look at this and I think this is where some of the questions are coming from, 
what I'm seeing here is a reclamation of the land. Mm -hmm. I'm not fully seeing the connection of everything. And part of that might be my own bias in what I would expect to see. And that it's not just kind of a cross connection to the Capitol Hill neighborhood, but I'm really looking for that stronger connection to the uh, walk that's proposed to go across the river and like really bringing the whole thing together into something that people can walk around and like get from both sides to use your environment. And I think the other thing that's really kind of throwing at least me off right. in this is that the the focus of your development seems to be along M Street, which is the primary um, vehicular connection that already exists as far as I understand. Yes. Um, and so in, in some ways, when I look at that as your primary focus, what I'm not seeing is a re-emphasis on the waterfront. And in some ways, I feel like you've put your focus off the waterfront and you've made some moves to bring that water into the center of the site through the canals and the kayak, um, I guess, house, the rowing house or whatever. Uh, I'm not getting the term right, but I'm hoping you understand what, well, I'm, what I'm pointing to. So I, I get your point and thank you for your questions. So a couple of things, the, the notes tend to be on M Street, but that's not, not being said that this, the blocks and the diversity of each block has been already been studied in terms of to offer more diversity in mm -hmm. the neighborhood. So for the real estate development program, I studied the blocks of having residential around this area where how is the affordable units can work in this area and how can bring people with low income to this community. So that was the main course of the real estate uh, component of my uh, study. The other thing where I focused around this area here, I wanted this building is not to have only the board club. Uh -huh. That's why I divided to three different buildings. And there is an industrial, like the, the diversity between the building and each plug, there is, a, there is a use. If I went back to the uses diagram, maybe that will help. Let's see that in each block, there is an industrial and there is retail space. Industrial, most of the industrial function, it will, it will offer jobs to people with the low income. Mm -hmm. And then the potential is to bring the people, the affordable units to this area. So people don't really have to commute, comm commute that far. Uh, so each block has that diversity of not only high-end residential, but also has a diversity of where people can uh, walk on, in these alleys of this block and see uh, workshops and see people that has, they're not like looking like them mm -hmm. and uh, kind of to connect with them. That is the entire thing. The intention of this uh, study is from day one was it, it was not to bring the a second wharf to the area. Uh -huh. It's more about make it like more about the people itself. And that's why you can see that every block is kind of designed in a way that there is a smaller diversity buildings into them. And the boats center is also has a community club in it. So it's it's not only for the low, right. <laughs> the it's high so income. I know the idea of boats and kayaking center sounds more of a high end, but that's not the intentional. That's there is workshop space just less than ten feet, like um, like less than ten feet from this building. So, so I'm not, I'm not challenging the the diversity of what you are exploring and proposing as part of your design. What I will say is that what comes out in the presentation right. is not that. And so maybe part of that is just a conversation of a rebalancing of which portions of your process right. um, were presented as part of this, this presentation um, because the, you, you have a whole year's worth of work put into this, right? Sure. I, this is not the total sum of everything you've done all year, yeah. but this is what's in front of us. So this is what we can react to. Sure. And my reaction is it's all along that Capitol Hill border, right? Yeah. And so I, I hear 
the frustration in the way that it's coming off, but I do think it's to be said that part of it is in the, the presentation and just something to keep in mind on, on the long end is, you know, the connection of the story to what you're, what you're putting in front of the people that you're telling the story to. Okay. Thank you. I uh, really liked your presentation. And um, I remember I was on a panel um, or just kind of listening to a panel with the, the mayor's office and um, some developers. And uh, they made a kind of a kind of a quick comment, which I thought was really revealing about DC is like all the easy sites in DC are pretty much developed already. And right. all we have left are the hard sites. And this is one of those hard sites. It is. <laughs> um, it's cut off by major highways. You have the rail line, topography, floodplain issues. This is a very difficult site in general to develop. And uh, so I appreciate your ambition to kind of take this under everyone can agree it's like it could be so much better than what it is today of course um and turning into something and uh, actually my favorite diagram in the entire presentation was the overlay of the l'enfant plan on yeah. the site. that was really compelling and really interesting and i do i do think you actually were inspired just kind of looking at your ultimate plan and how it ended up there was some uh influence clear influence there and um i think it seemed like you learned a lot from that exercise so i thought it was good i, I think my favorite thing about this uh, and I, I think it's a good urban design plan in general. The block sizes kind of fit into DC. It kind of, you know, you, you, you did your best overcoming these challenges and connecting back to Capitol Hill and kind of across the highway with M Street, um, you know, within the constraints and the topography. Uh, so I'll you on that. And I, I do think it, one of the cool ideas here is like bringing the water deep into the city. That's something that, you know, a lot of waterfront plans kind of have a, you know, they kind of keep the the water line and you know you have a kind of a, a very simple relationship whereas you're you're really creating docks and kind of hard edges and soft edges and really bringing the canal kind yeah. of bringing the water in Ralph and i uh, work on the cno canal and you know we're several blocks away from the river but we we actually can appreciate the water you know pretty deep inside the city so um i think that is a kind of unique urban design move that you know i, I had not thought of and i think it's a really creative way to kind of do that i, I think um, a lot of what we're reacting to as a panel here is uh, your thesis covered so many topics and and it's hard to kind of uh, zoom in on anyone because you could we could we could go very deep on any singular topic. So when, when we're trying to cover 10 topics, it's 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 difficult. But um, I, I do think there's a really great urban design kind of fundamentally here and I want to lot of you on that. Thank you. Thanks, Vadi. Great to see you. Thanks, Ralph. Um, I think that. You know, and I think this will be true of maybe most, if not all of the projects. I think that your graphics don't really explain the idea very well. And I think that it has to do with the raw material that you all are using, which is which are all these drawings and they're all kind of wonderful, but there there's not a lot of hierarchy in the in the drawings, right? I mean, if you look at the size of these drawings, so those three perspectives are the biggest thing, and they tell me almost nothing about your actual idea. <laughs> so I think they're interesting, but they don't, you know, I think your idea really has to do with, with um, this and this and this. Right. Your piece is all in itself. Just right. That yep. So these sections up here, which are kind of small, and also sort of stop in Capitol Hill, at really at the edge. <laughs> I'd like to see those sections go all the way across the top of the presentation. I mean, all six boards. So that I could really understand that edge of Capitol Hill and how you're connecting the river to it, which is, I think, actually your idea. Yeah. So, um, and because I think it's, I actually think it's all here. I mean, I think it's, it's really great. But we have to extrapolate a lot to get to that. Right. Um, and I, I do think that in general in school, and I say this at every review, I think sections are really underdrawn and perspective sections are almost never drawn. And they, they, it would really help us. Like th if these perspectives were actually a, a part of sections, it would really help us to understand the project. So I, you know, I think it's great. I also want to talk about the architecture of these buildings, uh, of the the rowing pavilions. I actually think they're incredibly cool. I mean, they're sort of Dutch, um, uh, Dutch psychedelic roofs, <laughs> mountains. 
um, CLT mountains. Um, I actually think that that's great. I think that, you know, there's a tradition of very different kinds of buildings that are actually on the water and they tend to be lighter um, and they tend to be more like follies. And, you know, I think that that makes very logical sense. So again, I think your project is incredibly strong in section. I just can't see it. I just, can I just say that I actually really enjoy all this. I don't want you to think that I'm like, this doesn't make sense. I really appreciate the attention that's given to the different kind of nodes and environments that you're creating at that elevation change that you're trying to connect the two to. Right. I just wish you had focused on that yeah. as, as your thesis. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, I was gonna I was gonna say something I was trying to resist saying something about the architecture but I I feel like um, but I think that's because the depth of the investigation and, and the, what you started with I actually thought my, some of my favorite graphics were your kind of demographic economic kind of tools that you use like there was a you know some of these pinwheel things were like really elegant and very thoughtful and, and telling um, so I'll, I'm gonna blush past past the uh the urban design part of it because i think a lot's been said I, I feel like it's a little bit heavy-handed some of the the how you're articulating the waterfront edge like i don't know that you needed to like carve it so much i like the idea of the canals coming into it but could it have been a little bit more graceful um and i and i and i also echo christina's comments about kind of connecting like the relationship to the 11th street bridge and the and that kind of promenade and how that connects in i think would be a, a another level of of thinking about it in terms of the architecture i'm i'm a little confused by it not that it couldn't be different but i think part of it's like you didn't talk about it i don't understand why it looks the way that it does Ar you know formally um it actually doesn't really read like clt to me it reads like a concrete you know board form concrete building or something I, so part of me i'd like I'll, I'll end my comment just since i know you did a lot of thinking i know it didn't come from it nowhere so tell can you tell us a little bit about why it looks the way it does like what was there a, uh, something that sponsored the form of it or the kind of i don't know the way that it looks the clt board house so the main concept when we start looking at it was uh studying presidents of board houses and um and when we're looking uh, at it, they're using the material of wood and in the way that the same, uh, it's, it is the material to construct uh, the the boats itself. It, 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 it started to make more sense that using material that represent the product that is really happening or the activities that are really, really taking place in that building might be the, the approach to go, especially there will be a lot of uh, there will be a workshop space too that it will also have that uh, woody uh, and um, raw material uh, buildings and one of it also I don't want the exterior buildings look to look expensive too uh, looking uh, as maybe as stone or uh, as other material I want it to look more like a local material local wood that has been used to, to construct the same material that might be used to construct the boats itself has been used in the architecture of the building itself um i hope that makes sense you know um one of the things that I think is important to recognize when you see a project like this is not, you know, there's a lot of concern about, well, really, how does it benefit or deal with the local neighborhood and things like that? And that's a valid concern. But I would take a step back and say, what does it do for the city? You know, in Washington, D.C., the Anacostia Waterfront Initiative's whole point was to bring the city to the resource of the water. And on the, one of the previous reviews, Ralph asked um, um, what is the most significant asset, you know, which turned out in that case to be the metro station. Here it's clearly the water. You know, getting to the water has high value. And, you know, when you think about the benefits to the city, Washington has a very significant housing crisis. And it is made worse by the fact that we keep – making it more difficult for developers to build housing rather than easier. And one of the things benefits, I, a couple of benefits I think of a project like this 
is that in its density and the amount of stuff it has, it has the potential to introduce more affordable housing and more housing in general, which will impact the cost of housing and hopefully bring it down. And I think this sort of visionary project by a student to show a place where you could build and address that problem is a citywide benefit, which I think is significant. The second is a citywide benefit of public space that it's not just for the people on Capitol Hill and the yacht clubs that do exist along the Anacostia are private and they are not public. And this, I think, really trying to make a public amenity right. out of this kind of activity, I think is a significant difference. And I don't think it's about privatizing. And I think it's really trying to say, if we're going to have a maritime activity here, let's make it something that is available to everybody and present it in a very public way. And that's a significant benefit, I think. And then finally, I would say that I think, you know, one of the things about urban design that's really important to keep in mind is that cities change over time. And while the upper levels might remain residential, whatever they are, the ground levels of buildings oftentimes are different than when you originally programmed them to be. And one would imagine that, you know, if this was to be developed by the city, you know, and if it was, I don't know who owns, I think Washington Gas owns some of the land and things like that. But you would really want to kind of robust engagement with like DEMPED and other folks to say, here's the kind of program things to benefit the city in general. And other folks who live across the river or nearby or whatever could weigh in and that the ground levels of buildings might be programmed to be able to achieve some of those things. I think that's a scale of reality of urban design that is not a building scale reality, but it's a reality that one encounters in a big project like this. And I can tell you at the wharf, they did over 600 public meetings to try and get that right, to try and really understand how to program the different places that happen at the wharf. And I think a similar thing would be would be underway here. The one thing, the thing that I think doesn't read well in terms of all that is this public hall here. It looks a little dark and dingy there and like someplace I wouldn't go into necessarily, Fadi. Yeah. But I think the idea of it hosting a public terrace on top and a public space that could be programmed for a lot of different things is a nice public amenity to make available to everybody. So I think, I think Ralph's right. Some of the main ideas don't pop because of the scale they're drawn at or the views they're taking. But I, and I know the project better than most, but, but I think there is an intentionality behind making public assets out of a great deal of this that I think is really what was at the foundation of what you were trying to do. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Uh, I just want to say I completely agree with the last two comments. Um, I um, I didn't notice it at the beginning, uh, but I do feel that what, what you were saying, that the, the relationship between those existing pieces of infrastructure and the water right. is the project. And I'm start, suddenly starting to see everything else as noise. <laughs> and and that particularly in reference to all of this stuff that you don't seem to be particularly interested in either. Yeah. Um, and so what I see here is like an enormous amount of investment in what I think are great uh, examples of design. And more specifically, I think something that could be read as landscape design. I don't know that it's, maybe I'm totally off the mark, right? Because I haven't, I haven't followed your project from the beginning, but could this just be a park? And could this just be a park with maybe follies on it? that start um, augmenting the public dimension, as was pointed out a second ago, um, be maybe less intrusive in the way in which uh, the, the uh, park and the infrastructure interact. And for me, like, I, I, I do agree that there is a way in which this could be more gentle, but actually I would make it more aggressive. I would go deeper with those canals and I would actually make some of this stuff jut out and create connections with the other side because we talked a lot about the other side but it seems that it's some, somewhat forgotten in the development of the project I'm just throwing it out there as a provocation but I do think that uh, something like the freeway park in Seattle is I would right. definitely check that out like getting really specific about the relationship between um, ugly infrastructure and nature and then design into that gap um, 
I, I kind of feel that's what you're already doing. Yeah. And I wish you went like all the way. <laughs> it started with earlier iteration that that canal system were way more aggressive and they connected more with both lines and uh, in vertical and horizontal way. Uh, there was a lot of um, technical issues that we are, uh, we kind of uh, want to make sure that this thesis really uh, cover correctly. Um, but at the same time, uh, there is what challenges, what, what the most challenging thing about bringing more canal, especially furthermore, or in this area is the topography levels. I studied different sections and different, different rotation and to draw the existing canal. What if it goes in different spaces in the streets and, uh, if we get it further, we can go into a deep 35 feet down, uh, which won't be as appealing as uh, the, the places that the, the, the canal are right now cutting into, because the canal right now, the way that they works is really works with the topography and the direction of them. Um, but uh, I really appreciate your comments. Uh, I think, yeah, you're right about many points. Yeah. We'll do Michelle, and then if we want to hear from our dev, and then Peter. Fadi, I just want to commend you on um, incredible work and thought process that went into this. Um, uh, I missed the first few minutes of your presentation, but uh, I know, and, and the title does say industrial land use on the Anacostia waterfront. Right. And from when you first spoke to me about this project, I was really, really excited about that dimension. I mean, it's sort of a revolutionary thing to do to bring work and light industry back into a post-industrial city and especially a city like DC, right. right? That is so monumental and so sort of overwhelmed by um, functions of government and, and in terms of residential housing crisis as, as some people, Matt and others have said. So um, I just wanna, if you could go back to that axon where you showed the, the green, like you showed all the housing in green. <laughs> <laughs> like a little um, sketch of what the massing would look like. Yeah, so I actually like that accent better because I think my reaction just in terms of representation is the, the projection of the street grid into the waterfront um, feels like in the in that white axon in the middle, yep. it feels like the, the street grid is, and I know it's, I guess it's from the L'Enfant yep. plan. So it's it it's is. it's being sort of rammed into the waterfront and allowed to shape the waterfront. Whereas when I think of industry, I think of I mean, one of the reasons um architects, architectural critics and architects have loved these old industrial waterfronts, despite their polluting effects that we see in retrospect, is their informality, you know, right. and their sort of honest use of function and casual organization on the sites, you know. So I, I think another pass at that first level would, would think, well, what does it mean to really have light industry and let that be the thing and then allow it to shape the waterfront a little bit more than what you did. And, the whole water and how, how does the work part, which is so missing, the jobs and the work, I right. mean, those two things are really interrelated, right? Jobs near where affordable housing is, that's a pretty revolutionary thesis. And I think it's more like on the left, you know, it's sort of more like in the process of becoming, whereas here, because it's white and it's very linear, right. it feels almost like monumental DC is thrust into the waterfront. Right. Thank you. Uh, Fadi, good job. Thank you, Maria. I, I think you did a tremendous job. As I said yesterday uh, during Jan's um, presentation, it's so difficult um, for architecture and uh, real estate development master students to balance uh, those two things. And I think you did a good job of doing that. I'm glad that you talked about the demographics and the market analysis that you did so that you could sort of shape what the uses of the, uh, of the uh, program would be. Um, I am particularly interested in this, uh, uh, in this 
proposal uh, as I uh, led and was very involved in the most of the affordable housing that was done at the Navy Yard. Um, uh, former Mayor uh, Tony Williams was very intentional about the fact that he wanted affordable housing incorporated in that project. Um, and I think that your uh, intentionality around incorporating affordable housing in, in this project uh, really complemented what was done at the Navy Yard. Um, I also think that bringing the activity of rowing and kayaking to this demographic is a great idea. Um, we often associate that activity with uh, higher income individuals, but you know, uh, those with lower income can get involved in this activity as well. And that's the whole idea of doing mixed income projects so that the, uh, those populations can learn from each other and experience the things that uh, each of them do. So uh, I really like, I won't speak to the architecture side of it, but uh, as the developer uh, on the development side, I think it really is a really good project for this site. And I congratulate you on your work here. Thank you very much, Maria. Hey, Fetty, I'll be really brief. I just wanna say, um, I really admire your absolute dedication to making places for the public. And I admire your absolute dedication to um, urbanism because in the end, that's what this is. And it's really quite, I think, an extraordinary idea. And, um, and I think that uh, what we see, I think in particular, the, the plan, uh, this axon here, and then this axon over here, which we really haven't spoken about, I think really talk a lot about what your idea is. And I think if you had done a little bit more discussing the connection between the PDR zone and how that manifested here, I think that would have um, taken care of a lot of uh, some of the confusion at the beginning. But either way, bravo, and I can't wait for you to start your career with me. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank you, Christian. So I, I get the last word as the chair, and I think um, Body's thesis does um, what we could hope with any thesis, which is to bring a great conversation uh, to the school, you know, from our panel, from our faculty, from our students. And so um, you should be uh, proud of that work. I think the conversation brought up some great points. I think Christina's points about the connectivity are well taken. Um, Stefano and Nandor both commented on the um, shaping of the shoreline and how either aggressive or not aggressive it was. Um, there's probably, I don't know, 30 block plans that show it being all canals or no canals. And so um, I think this is kind of where it landed in the last few weeks. Um, Ralph has coined a new phrase, psychedelic uh, Dutch architecture which is great to hear. Um, and and Matt, Matt had a good comment, which Dupuy would have said with three words, access equals value. Um, and so I think um, Fadi has had a long journey in coming to the school and I hope he continues to share his future journeys with us. Thank you so much. Thank Fadi. you very much, Peter. Thank you. I got a question. Thank you. Okay, and Matt, congratulations to our morning thesis presenters, and that concludes our morning session. We'll be back down here at 2 um, for the afternoon session. Hope everyone can stay and join us for that. I meant to say this too. He would have said commitment to site, yeah. and this is a real... Right, and it's not even that I, I feel like your thesis had to be like, so all economic groups have equal feel like they have access to the same. I, I think it's a great thing that everybody should have access to. Why 